afternoon everyone and welcome to the pre-show show not quite to the show just yet um, so myself and VM are in search of leopards this afternoon so I'm having a very close look around the, the, the area where James was let's have a look there goes a little Dacre just running off darting off through the bush let us see. Now it's very difficult to work out exactly where they were. And I have a feeling that Karula um, perhaps came back into the area to try and find these little cubs, um, which would make it even harder to find. But let's, uh, let's see, I'm going to try my best to have a good look around and scan. Perhaps they're sitting on a termite mound up in a tree. It's a bit cooler this afternoon, which does help us a bit. They might not necessarily be lying in a drainage line hiding from us. Um, but let's have a look. I hope everybody's having a good day. It's, uh, is it, is it Monday, Viam? It's mon Monday, I think. <laughs> for us, every day is the same. It, uh, it um, doesn't change for us. So, um, but if you, if you are having a Monday, if you, I hope you're having a good Monday. <laughs> Uh, Mike Malone, good afternoon to you. You say um, that, it, thank goodness, we are having summer and you must be experiencing cold winter. I know a friend of mine is in London at the moment and uh, she was saying it is freezing. So I'm sure Europe, the entire Europe is getting quite cold at the moment, um, especially Germany and London. Um, I must be honest, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to have a little cold winter. I mean, the summer is fantastic, but but I do enjoy winter at times. I suppose our winter isn't as bad as yours, so maybe I need to experience it before I say I'd like to like to be there. I've never been skiing, actually. Speaking of winter, I've never been skiing, and I'd love to do that one day. So perhaps perhaps a holiday in his order is in order to the slopes of uh, the Alps or somewhere interesting. Apri ski, isn't that the one that's very, very popular? Apri ski. Now it's quite thick around here, everyone, so it's gonna be tricky, I think, to find these young leopards. And it's tough. We all know how well the leopards are camouflaged and they can disappear if they don't want to be seen. But uh, luckily we've got all afternoon to have a look for them and we're gonna try our best. That is what I'm going to do this afternoon is I'm going to look for leopard or leopards and that's it. My hunt for, for elephant has been very unsuccessful the last little while. I've had no luck with elephant and uh, I think it's just because there's food and water everywhere. So it becomes very difficult to find them when they do spread out and disperse. Probably head down to the rivers, more permanent water sources. So we are going to be um, going live fairly soon. So we'll see you all a bit later. Jamie is out with us this afternoon on the vehicle and James is going to be walking again. All right, so we'll see you all later. Goodbye for now. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to the middle of the African wilderness where all kinds of exciting live safari adventures await. 
This is Safari Live. Ready. Standing by. to all of you to the Sunset Safari. Well, my name is Jamie and this afternoon I have the amazing Brian on camera with me, complete of course with the sun. And a very special, very warm welcome to the students at Providence Elementary and Lynn Haven Elementary. It is wonderful to have you on board. The reason I'm going so slowly is because I'm actually looking for a specific type of bird to show you. But before we go into that, so what's happening right here, so what you're seeing right here on your screens is happening right here and right now in a magical part of Africa called South Africa and to be more specific right up in a place called the Greater Kruger National Park. So the Greater Kruger National Park is a massive massive conservation area. It's 8.5 million hectares just to give you a sort of a rough idea. So it's about 4 million football fields in size. It's bigger than some small countries. Now, because it's happening right here and right now, that means that all of you can almost imagine as if you're on the back of the safari vehicle with us. And you could see lions, you could see elephants, you could see antelope, really cool insects, and everything in between. That's the amazing thing about these live drives, is that we don't know what you're going to see, and you definitely don't. So I want you to imagine that if you're on the back of the vehicle with me, you've got your hat on, because even though it's cloudy, it's one of those cloudy days here in South Africa. It's actually midsummer, so it's very, very hot. There you go. Joshua, you and I are on exactly the same page. He wants to know what season it is. In South Africa, it is the middle of our summer, which must seem a little strange for you because, of course, this December holidays and Christmas is coming, that's for all of you in midwinter. But for us here in South Africa, December is our summer holidays and it is very, very hot. This afternoon is not too bad, it's 28 degrees centigrade, which is 83 in Fahrenheit. So pretty warm, pretty warm and a little bit sweaty, but not too bad. Sometimes it gets over 100 Fahrenheit. Now India, welcome, you want to know what bodies of water are nearby. Um, we have a lot of very big rivers that run through this area. Now unfortunately where we are, which is a place called Juma. So we've got a tiny little, not a tiny little, but we've got a section of the reserve that we drive. But there are very big rivers. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Limpopo River. Now that's going to flow into the Indian Ocean, which is on our eastern coast. Now the Indian Ocean on the eastern coast of South Africa and the Atlantic on the western coast. So those are our two oceans. We've got some big, big rivers, a river called the Sand River, a river called the Sabi River, the Whirlyfants River, which means Elephant River in one of our local South African languages. But we also have a lot of water holes around here and that's one of the things that both Byron and myself will be doing, Byron's also out on a vehicle, is we'll be checking the various water holes to see whether there are any animals drinking because they see them this afternoon they're all hiding from me. Where are they all Brian? I don't know. I don't know either. They are all hiding away but we're going to look really carefully and really hard. Luckily, we're not alone out here. There's Byron on the vehicle. There's also James on foot, and I'm pretty sure he's going to have you all laughing. Let's head across to him so that he can... Oh, hold on one moment. Ah, Little antelope. Here we go. We've got our first animal. Look carefully. It's a very shy one. See how she's run away? And there she goes. Sorry about that. I just thought that it might be nice for you to see an animal very quickly. But she has run away. That was a, an animal called a Stirnbok, which is a type of antelope, tiny little antelope. Right, where was I? I believe I was sending you over to James Henry so that he can say a very good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon, all you special people from Lynn Haven Elementary School and Providence Elementary. My name is James, and I... 
I'm on foot today, and jean -Dre is filming me. Say hello, jean -Dre. Hello. There we go, there's jean -Dre. And behind this bush here is a friend of ours called Aubrey. And Aubrey is a local man from this area, and he is a tracker and a guide and a ranger, and he's been living here for a long time, and he's going to show us and help us as we go through here. Now, the first thing I want to show you here, of course, is that if you're on foot in the bush, and perhaps it starts to rain or it gets very cold, you, I'm sure, have many of you have built little forts in your gardens or in some wild places that you've been. How perfect is this special tree? Hey, this is the perfect place to build a little fort. I used to do this when I was a kid. I'd do this in the garden and what I would do is come in here, I'd clear away the sticks on the ground so it was nice and comfy. I might try and find something that I could just maybe, if it was going to rain, I might try and put a tarpaulin over the top or something like that. Otherwise, I'm sheltered here from the wind, I'm sheltered from the cold, and if it was raining and I didn't have a tarpaulin, then I would sit close up like this against the tree and I'd be able to hide from any of the elements. Now, thing I would have to carefully do if I was going to sit here for any length of time is check. Anything Yeah, sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. Officially, my name is Byron, and we have a big buffalo. Well, let's try that again, rather. We have a buffalo, and my name is Byron, and on camera this afternoon is Viam. I uh, hope you have had a lovely day so far, or that you are having a great day. And that's nice. I haven't actually seen a buffalo around for a while. Um, every now and then we get a glimpse of these big old bulls. And this one seems to be alone. I don't see any others at the moment around here. Now, Lauren, you want to know what is the biggest animal I have ever seen? Lauren, um, we, I think the, the biggest one I've seen would be a whale. That's probably the largest animal I've ever seen. But out here, definitely an elephant. That's the biggest animal we get out here. And I'm hoping that we can try and find some elephant. And uh, But we'll see. But so nice to see a big buffalo. Let's see if I can have another view a view of the uh, the horns. Let me just move forward a little bit for you. Nick, you want to know what kind of animals are there in Africa? Uh, that might be a better view of it. There we go. Now, Nick, um, sure, we have lots of animals in Africa. Uh, it's hard to describe all of them, but some of the, the well-known animals that you might know, Nick, or that you've heard of are elephant, buffalo, lion, leopard, um, where there are cheetah, <clears throat> there's different antelope species like impala, kudu, uh, there's hippopotamus, there's crocodiles, there's so many different animals and that's just a, a small portion and small idea of what we have out here. We do have many many different animals around and, um, and it's always great to see them and especially big old buffalo like this. Eva, you wanted to know if the animals hibernate in Africa. Uh, no, they don't. In fact, uh, the only animals that would hibernate would be snakes. Um, as we know, snakes need, as reptiles do, they do hibernate in the winter. But in Africa, the animals don't hibernate like the bears do um, back home where you are from in the United States. And um, what else? What else do you have that hibernates? I'm not actually sure. I know you have got some other other animals, but uh, we don't have any. These animals are active throughout the year. And it's great to have all of the young children from Providence and Lynn Haven with us, and we love getting your questions. So don't forget to ask your teachers to send your questions through to us. Um, and Bryce, you asked, are buffalo friendly? Now have a look at this male. What would you say, Bryce? Does he look friendly, or does he look like he could potentially have been unfriendly? <laughs> It's a very, very old male. You can see some scars and scratches around their faces. Lily, you want to know what do buffalo eat? And there we can see him eating right now. He feeds on grass. 
and that's generally all buffalo feed on so we call them grazers now a grazer is an animal that only feeds on grass and the buffalo diet is predominantly grass so that's what they feed on but um, these old males often move around by themselves Guess you wanted to know how much do I think this animal weighs now this big buffalo could be around 700 or 800 kilograms somewhere around there um, now I'm trying to think in pounds what's that about a hundred and hundred and eighty somewhere probably a hundred and eighty hundred and ninety pounds no I'm lying a thousand eight hundred and thousand nine hundred pounds that's about it that's what it would weigh so very very heavy Oh, he's disappearing in through the thicket. We're going to head back to my friend James, who's walking in the bush at the moment. I think I'll try and move. There's a very, very special little animal here, everyone, and it's a lizard. Now, a lot of people are quite afraid of lizards and afraid of snakes and such things like that. But out here, lizards are completely harmless normally. And you know what? I don't know what kind of lizard this is. We don't get very many of them here. And while we look at this special lizard, I'm trying to get a little bit closer so I can see it properly. Philip, you're wondering about what kind of snakes we get here. You'll see how slowly I'm moving to try and make sure that I don't give him a fright. Philip, we get lots and lots of different kinds of snakes. Ones you might have heard of, black mamba. Ooh, a lot of people are very scared of black mambas. We get um, uh, puff adders, which are quite similar. Your rattlesnakes over there in the U.S., then we get pythons and striped bellied sand snakes and tree snakes and vine snakes and tiger snakes and red-lipped heralds and bibrons, burrowing asps. Well, you can see that we get lots of different kinds of snakes here. But you know what? We hardly ever see them because everybody, and this is very important for you to understand, snakes are scared of us. They are more scared of us than we are of them. So they hear us coming, they hear our voices, they feel our feet moving along the ground, and then they disappear down a hole and they try and not see us. It's only when they're very, very, very scared of us that they start to become dangerous. Now, this lizard, everybody, this lizard is, thinks I can't see it. And it thinks I can't see it, and that's why it's sitting so very still. Can you see how very cleverly... Coming down. Oh, perfect timing. It seems as though perhaps you lost James in the middle of his sentence, and we are sorry for that. But your timing, as I said, is absolutely perfect because we've come across one of my favorite creatures. Look at it go! Look how fast it is! Now, this afternoon, we are on a mission to try and find a leopard, but what we found now is actually called a leopard a tortoise, and they are one of my favorite animals. You know how tortoises are meant to be slow? Look how fast this little one's going. Run, 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 run! Oh, now he's hiding behind a tree. Okay, should we try go around and see if he's popped out the other side? Now, tortoises are one of my absolute favorite animals. Now, there's actually, many of you will be thinking that, that that's what we call a turtle. Now, a turtle, um, in terms of its proper definition, so what the animals, the difference between these animals actually is, a turtle is has a shell like a tortoise but it has flippers and it lives mainly in the ocean and only really comes onto land when it's time to lay eggs. Then we get tortoises which live on land and feed and feed the feed off plants and grass and various materials. There you are, I see you. Shame. Look he's hiding in there. So a tortoise walks on land and they've got feet, not flippers. And the reason that this is called a leopard tortoise is because look at the spots on its shell. That's why it looks a lot like the spots of a leopard. See how our little tortoise is hiding? 
That's because he thinks that we can't see him in this dense vegetation. Now, we only see tortoises in our summer, which is when the rain falls. So in winter, we don't have any rain at all. But during summer, that's when it rains, and that's when the tortoises come out. So they don't hibernate like a lot of animals in North America. But they will um, come out, they will do what's known as estivation, which means they basically sleep during the winter months. Jay, you want to know why is a tortoise shell designed like that? This is the amazing thing about a tortoise. So that shell is solid bone, and it's designed like that to protect the soft and sensitive body that's inside the shell. So it's made of bone, and if you can imagine, the spine, just like you or I have running down the middle of our back, that's fused along with the ribs and it creates this amazing hard bony shell that can help protect it. But of course, it can't be completely solid because somehow the tortoise has got to move. So it's got holes for the legs and holes for the tail underneath. And underneath that shell, there's the leg. If you look really closely, it actually looks like it's part of the dirt. It's hiding just behind that stick. That's the tortoise's leg. But if, you, if I were to go and pick up the tortoise and lift it up, the part underneath would be hard. Now they are absolutely amazingly designed. They're like little tanks to help keep them safe. <laughs> Pretending we can't see it. Now, oh, Anya, you want to know if tortoises are quicker than turtles? That is a very good question. Um, I don't think so, no. So turtles are very, very good swimmers and they cover huge distances. Tortoises, well, that's about as fast. You saw the way that this tortoise was running earlier. That is about as fast as a tortoise will run. Um, they can't get much faster than that. Uh, they don't have flippers, so they're not moving about in the ocean. They're also much, much smaller than your average sea turtle. Something like a leatherback turtle or a loggerhead turtle. Our leopard tortoises are slower on land. However, our leopard tortoises can swim, just not very well. So not nearly as well as a, as a um, turtle. Look, he's trying to turn round now. <laughs> And Mylene, you want to know if there are different types of tortoise. Yes, there are. So the leopard tortoise is probably one of the tortoises that we see most commonly. There are a couple of different species, but we only, in this particular area, we only really see a leopard tortoise and a tortoise known as a speaks hinged tortoise. I don't know who speaks was and um, what, he, what role he had to play or why he has a tortoise named after him, but a speaks hinged tortoise. Now what I'm going to do is, I'm not going to frighten the tortoise anymore but I'm just going to hop out so you get an idea because sometimes it's quite difficult to work out exactly how big something is if you're just looking at it through the camera. So hold on a moment, I'm going to hop out, make sure that there's not a leopard looking at me because that's actually what we came to look for and then go and have a look at the size of this tortoise. Hello! So I'm not going to go right in and I'm not going to pick it up and I'll explain why in a moment but look at the size of the tortoise. There's my hand, I'm in a tree, it's very uncomfortable, and it's quite scratchy, so that's how big this tortoise is. And this tortoise could be a good 10 years, maybe even more old. So it's not a young tortoise, this is not a baby tortoise, this is quite an old tortoise. They take a long time to grow. Huh, would you like a snack, Brian? Would you like a snack? Yes, I think we should find, let me find some ripe ones for you. Oh, you should never, ever, ever eat berries unless you know what they are. As it is, I happen to know that you can eat these berries, but, and so does Brian, because Brian will have had these before. They're called white berries because they're white. You know, sometimes people are not very good at naming things. So these are white berries, and human beings can eat them, but please don't ever eat a berry unless an adult says that it's okay. So you can't eat a berry unless you've got permission from an adult, because some berries can make you very, very sick, and some berries out here can make us very sick. And even these, I'm going to give some to Brian, and I'm going to eat some myself, but both of us know that you have to spit out the seeds first. Let me plug my earpiece back in so I can hear your questions first. And then I will give Brian some seeds, uh, some berries, not seeds. Don't eat the seeds, Brian. No, won't. Please don't eat the seeds, they'll make you feel, feel horrible. Your head will go all woozy. There we go. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Not bad. 
and out go the seeds. Oof. Here we go. Not quite ripe, are they, Brian? Oh, no, not quite ripe. Not quite ready to be eaten. Piff. Yuck. <laughs> Aaron, you wanted to know what do tortoises eat? They eat plant material. They eat plants, they eat grass, they eat basically they're herbivores, they're vegetarians, is what tortoises eat. You might even find that perhaps this tortoise is enjoying a snack somewhere in the bottom there. Right, since our tortoise has decided to be shy, would you like to come on an adventure with me? But before we do that, Lynnhaven Elementary class, you all want to know how old do tortoises get? Remember how we talked about different types of tortoise? Well, they're, they're, depending on what species of tortoise, it depends on how long they will live. But a leopard tortoise, how, how old do you think a leopard tortoise can get? Just quickly guess, shout out a number quickly. A leopard tortoise can get to 70 years old. So as long as a human being, basically. 70, not 17, seven zero years old. And some tortoises, of course, in the Galapagos and other places in the world, they've lived well over a hundred years. Just imagine how many things a tortoise has seen in its life. This tortoise, as I said, probably over 10 years old. Now, I'm going to go on an adventure and see if I can find a very, very exciting thing for you. In the meantime, let's head over to Byron and see what he's up to. Now, everyone, we are looking for a female leopard with her two little cubs. Um, I haven't ha seen any signs of them yet, but somebody has said they've seen tracks of her. So I'm going to try to get into that area where we had tracks very, very quickly. Hang on, I just saw an antelope off to the left I'd like to show you. And there we go, beautiful in Yala. And there's a male and a female there. Look at that. Now, the female is the one on the left, and look how different she is to the male on the right. They almost look like they are two different animals, but they are the same species of antelope, and those are called Enyala. Very funny name, it's spelled N-Y-A-L-A, -A, Nyala, and they are really beautiful. One of my favorite antelopes in this area. Beautiful white markings on the body, those stripes. Uh, Jamal, you want to know, have I ever seen an animal fighting in Africa? Uh, yes, Jamal, I have. And actually, what, this antelope, the Inyala, I've seen two males fighting before. Often you get these antelope fighting for dominance or for territory. That basically means a home space where they can keep uh, other, other males out. And there they go. Look at them running. That's wonderful. So, Jamal, I've seen many animals fighting. Um, so some of these antelope, they do fight, and that's why they have their horns, so they can fight and challenge one another with their horns. I've seen leopards fighting. I've seen lions fighting. Um, so I have seen a number of different animals fighting in Africa. Now, Max, you want to know how these animals defend themselves. So, unfortunately for these females, they don't have any horns um, with their nyala, but the males do have the horns, and they would use those to try and defend themselves. Those horns are very, very sharp, so the predators have to be careful of them. But what the females will do is they're very, very fast and agile, and they can move through very thick bush like this very, very quickly. As we saw, as we saw, they can move very, very quickly. Anyway, I'm going to stick to our plan. Let's go and see if we can find that area where we have tracks of the female leopard with the little cubs. It's a lovely, cool afternoon, so perhaps they're quite active and moving around. It's not as hot. And I say that because when it is very hot, the animals tend to rest and they lie in the shade a lot more. They don't like moving around as much. Some of the antelope will still move around. Now, uh, Kai, you want to know, are there wildebeest here? There are indeed. There are indeed wildebeest in this area. And we'll see. Maybe we can find some for you this afternoon. 
do see them occasionally, but not hundreds and thousands of wildebeest like you might be used to seeing in East Africa, in Kenya and Tanzania. There are plenty of wildebeest over there. We've got small groups, small herds, maybe 20 or 30 together at times, but we do have wildebeest around here. All right, so I'm going to try and get into that area very quickly where there are tracks of a leopard. While I do that, let's head back to James, who's walking in the bush. It's very, very special to find this many reptiles on a drive, and you know why we're finding them, everyone? It's because it's warm, and there's a little bit of moisture around in the leaves, and there's some little puddles and ponds that the animals come and drink, and reptiles love it when it's warm. They don't like it when it's cold. And believe it or not, this reptile that we're looking at here, I think it's the same thing you were looking at with Jamie, is a leopard tortoise. And the leopard tortoise is a reptile in the same way as the lizard we saw is a reptile. Now what I'm hoping this one's going to do is eat this grass in front of us. Now I don't know, I'm sure all of you like to have competitions on the playground about who uh, can throw the furthest or run the furthest or whatever it is. Same thing here, you know. Jamie and I and Byron, we love to say, well, you know, I found a bigger tortoise than you found. Do you think my tortoise is bigger than Jamie's tortoise, or do you think it's smaller than Jamie's? Look, I think this one is huge. It must be bigger. And this is one of the fun things that we can do out here. We can get nice and close to the animals, especially the animals that are harmless. Now, this tortoise is completely harmless but we don't want to give him a fright. You see how he disappears into his shell when he's getting a little bit of a fright? And I have to tell you, he don't smell so good. He smells a little bit, well, a bit like rotting meat. I don't know why he smells like that. Maybe he's about to go to the loo. I don't know. Tortoises sometimes will go to the loo if they're very scared. Uh, they will sort of uh, make some poop, make some dung, and then they'll release that and that'll hopefully frighten away any of the predators that they might have. Isn't he great? There he comes. Now of course I don't know if this is a he or a she and the only way to tell would be to turn him over and look at his back. Or I'll tell you what we can do, I can just look underneath here. I'm going to say that I think this is a male tortoise and I think it's a male tortoise because he's got a very, what we call, these things here are called scoots everybody. See that? He's got a very long scoot at the back there and the females don't have a long scoot at the back so I think he's probably a male and maybe he's looking for a girlfriend. This is the right time of the year for a tortoise to be breeding and finding a girlfriend. Isn't that nice? <laughs> He's very scared of Jandre, you see. Oh no, Gus, you say that you think my tortoise is definitely smaller than Jamie's. Are you sure? Look, I'm going to put my hand on him. You can see how big he is. I think he's huge. Remember, my hand's a bit bigger than Jamie's. So if Jamie did the same thing, well... Anyway, it doesn't really matter whether he's bigger or smaller. He's very magnificent regardless. Now, there was something else here on the ground I wanted to show you. Ah, here it is. Now, often, if you remember the little fort I showed you at the very beginning of the drive, often out here you have to be looking for things to eat, things that might be quite nice to eat, or things that the animals might eat, but you've equally got to be very careful of things that might poison you. Now, there are two things over here. This thing is called Strychnos madagascarensis. In other words, it's called the black monkey orange. Now, it looks pretty harmless, but it's got something in it. It's got a poison in the fruit called strychnine. Now, what strychnine will do is make your heart stop. I'm not really going to eat it. So you've got to be very careful about what you eat out here. You've got to be extremely careful. You must know all the plants before you come into an area and decide that you're going to eat it. One of the things we can eat, look, it's not very good for us, but this grass, mmm. is delicious. 
It's called guinea grass and it grows in the shade and the animals love it almost as much as I do. Mm, delicious. Look, the tortoise is starting to move. Let's have a look again. I'm going to move very slowly, remember, like we were doing with the lizard, because we don't want the tortoise to get a fright. doing he's trying to find a place to hide I think for the night he's probably been moving around quite a lot and now he wants to hide Bryce let's wait and watch and see what he does but you're wondering why the colors are so different here I'm assuming you're saying from where you are Bryce Bryce I don't even know where your school is so I'm afraid it's going to be a little bit difficult for me to tell you why the colors are different but the colors of an area like this are formed by many things you're in Virginia Beach, Virginia, okay, so you're in the middle of winter there. Well, the colors are different because the season is different, so it's summer now, and that means all the trees have got their green leaves on them, and we've got reptiles out, and also, of course, if you look down at the ground like this, you can see that there's quite a lot of soil. Now that soil determines what grows out of the ground. And of course the soil will be a different color in just about all parts of the world. So we've got totally different trees from the ones that you've got. Our sky as well, it's gray today, but it'll be slightly different from the sky that you have where you are, it'll be slightly different color. The soil will be different because everywhere on earth there's different kinds of soil, so that's why. Bryce, at least Marlene, you're wondering if we have any birds here. We have many birds here. We have over 250 different kinds of birds here. And I'm just going to listen, see if you can hear one there. It's going... And that is the ring-necked dove. That's a very common bird. The reason you haven't seen many birds today on your safari is that there's quite a lot of cloud around and the birds tend to like it only when it's sunny. They're a bit like us. They like to go out when it's sunny and warm. Okay, let's carry on walking, everyone. Now remember, ooh, you see, every time you stop somewhere, there's going to be something delicious. Look at that there. That's called an acria, everybody. Can you see it, Jandre? That butterfly is called a garden acria. Isn't that lovely? What he's doing, he's probably just come out of his cocoon and he's just drying his wings before he flies off and looks for some flower nectar to eat. Now, of course, one of the things that is uh, what we call limiting out here in Africa is water. We know that water is difficult to come by. So as we walk through here, I must ask, answer Bryce's question. And it's a very good question. You want to know, do all the rivers here flow into the Indian Ocean? Bryce, your knowledge of geography is obviously very, very good indeed. Um, you will find that when the rivers do flow, they eventually will end up in the Indian Ocean. So I'll tell you the part that water might take here. Down that way is a river called the Mluamati. Now it very seldom flows, but if there's a huge amount of rain it might flow. So it would flow down south like that and the Mluamati would eventually flow into, I think it's straight into the Sand River. The Sand River then flows into the Sabi River. The Sabi River then flows, I think, into the Crocodile River and the Crocodile River will flow eventually into a river in Mozambique and into the sea. So yes, a piece of water from here will go the way down into the Indian Ocean. Bryce, that is the most brilliant question. Well done. Now, from water to something that loves to drink water, needs to drink water, might be drinking water. Let's go and find out what it is with Jamie. And these animals do love drinking water. Look at this, some elephant. Oh, I'm so happy. I was chatting about hopefully finding elephant and I haven't seen elephant for quite some time. And now we've just bumped into two young males, it looks like, uh, which is quite interesting. Usually we do see them in herds, but the young males split away from the herds at times. They're moving through quite a thick area trying to feed at the moment, which is really, really interesting. There's a lot going on here, which is wonderful. Oh, wow. Now... 
It is so nice to see elephant, but I've seen something amazing that I would like to show you quickly. And it's it might, just give me a second. I'm going to try reposition for us. Um, and I'll show you why this is was so wonderful because this is the largest animal that we get in this area, and one of the smallest that we get here. Hold on a second. Have a look straight ahead on that termite mound there's some little dwarf mongoose with babies at the moment have a look at that they, um, they are incredible that is so so cute so from the big big elephant to these baby look at that dwarf mongoose all those little pups aren't they cute wow <laughs> that is incredible that is so special, everyone. I don't think I've ever seen baby mongoose that size before. And now they probably live inside that termite mound. And I think that's why the adults are all close by, keeping a watch out for the babies and allowing them to move around and play. Look at that. Oh, that is just too cute. Isn't that wonderful? Now this is one of the this is the smallest mongoose species that we get, and you can imagine how small those little babies are. Oh, that is really really wonderful. Everything's happening around us at the moment. Uh, Kai, you want to know if we have honey badgers in this area too? We do indeed. And Kai, I'll tell you a little secret, but that's my favorite animal, the honey badger. I love them. I really, really love them. But I haven't seen one for a long time. They're very, very shy little creatures. And um, we don't get to see them that often because they do generally come out at night. So it's not always easy to see them. Now... I've got another surprise for you. So stay with me. Those elephants have moved off. I can't see them anymore. They've moved through some very, very thick bush. And they've moved off feeding. I'm so glad we did get to see them though. This was incredible. But there's another little surprise for you. And as I said, it's all happening around us now. Very exciting. And you are so lucky to be with us and seeing this. Now, have a look at this. And I'm going to ask you to answer for me. So tell your teachers what animal you think this is. And hang on a second. There we go. I can see it. Just hold on. Uh, Lauren, you'd like to know, are the mongoose soft? Yes, they are. They are quite soft and furry. Very, very cute. Wonderful little animals. Now, hang on a second. Hang on. There we go. Should have a lovely view through there. Who can tell me what this animal is? Have a look at that. Sleeping on the termite mound, resting. So I'm just waiting for you to send me your answers before I tell you what it is. Now this, now this beautiful animal has got a beautiful pattern on it, not quite whole dots or spots, but what we call rosettes. You can see that pattern, very, very beautiful. They're very well camouflaged. These animals are usually solitary. They don't move around with other animals of the same species. You might find... Um, if a female has cubs, that's the only time you will see them with others. 
Um, sometimes you might find a male and a female together for a short while, but generally they move around by themselves. That's what solitary means, and they are by themselves most of the time, which I suppose can get a bit lonely, but they do meet up with other animals at some point. Uh, no, both Lynn Haven and Providence School, you both got it right. Well done. That is indeed a leopard, a beautiful, beautiful leopard. It looks like a female leopard from this angle. I can't really see on the other side. And I'll say that because it looks a little bit smaller, male leopards can get much, much bigger. And um, they're not always... Um, easy to spawn and from this side just from this angle it looks like a female but it is a bit difficult it does look like a female and as I said the males can get twice the size of females and remember I said to you it was nice and cool today and I was hoping that we if we did find a leopard it would be out in the open and not lying in the shade under a tree somewhere oh look at that cleaning herself is licking herself once or twice And um, because it is cool, this, this leopard has decided to lie on a termite mound. It's a nice cool breeze up there and she's resting and relaxing. So this is really, really a wonderful sighting. Now I'm going to, let's just see if she turns over. She's just moving ahead. She looks very comfortable up there. I'm going to sit with her a little bit. While we do that, let's head back to my friend James, who's still walking about. Now, everybody, we've got something very sad but very exciting to show you here. Well, I suppose it's not sad if you like ants. It is sad if you like termites. Now, the ants are the black and red things there. You can see them there. They're sort of, well, they're black with a little bit of red on them. And they are stealing. They are raiding the home of a termite colony. And what they're doing is you can see they're taking away the little worker termites. They're much smaller than the ants. They're probably spraying formic acids, a type of nasty chemical, onto the termites and then carrying them off back to their nest. And you see, for me, I, I really love termites. I don't know why I love termites, but I really do. And when I see something like this, to me it's very sad, but it's also very, very interesting because, the ter of course, the ants have to eat, and so they're basically just behaving like the lions, if you like, of the very small microscopic world. And there they are, taking the termites back to their home. Now, the termites lived on this branch of tree. And what you can see here, can you see my hand here, Jean-Dre? Mm, no, no, you can't. You can see this wood. And then you can see the sand next to it. And it's that sand that the termites were living inside. And now the ants have come and pulled it away. And from it, they are taking all the termites. And I think what you're going to find is that all of the termites here will be finished. They'll be carried off and they'll be put into the nest of the ants. And there, unfortunately, they're going to be eaten. Now, I want you to imagine something, everybody. I want to imagine that you are part, not as big as you are. I want you to imagine that you are that big. Tiny, 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 like that. And imagine one of these ants grabbed you behind the neck of your head, your neck here, and carried you back this way. Eva, you're wondering what kind of ants these are while I carry on with my story. Um, Eva, I don't actually know what kind of ants they are. They could be something called a pugnacious ant, but you know there's so many hundreds of different kinds of ants out here, I'm not sure exactly what these ones are. But we do know that they are meat-eating. Now imagine that ant has grabbed you behind your neck and is now pulling you along here. And let me show you where he's going to take you. Come over here, Jean-Dre. Round the side of this tree is where the ants are living. Now, they've got a whole nest here under the ground, and that's where the termites are going. Now, imagine one of these ants had grabbed you and you were still alive, and it had pulled you along here and down into the depths of its nest. Wouldn't that be the most terrifying thing in the whole world? Anyway, that's what's happening to the termites. So be very happy that you are not a termite being eaten by these pugnacious ants. Now, the other thing I just want to quickly show you 
these um, that they can be quite nasty. Now, I was bitten by one just now. I want to see if I can make one bite me again, just so I can explain to you what it feels like. It feels like a sort of little kind of bee sting, I suppose, but not nearly quite as bad. There they are. They're all coming up towards the nest and carrying with them termites. Shame, poor termites. Makes me very sad. Orlando, a very good question from you. Why can't the termites defend themselves? Well, they can to a certain extent. Sometimes they do. They have soldier termites with very big sort of pincers on the front of their jaws, and they'll bite at things like these ants. But these ants are very big, and they're very cleverly picked, the right kind of termites. These termites are not the termites that build mounds like this behind me here. They are much smaller than those ones, and yeah, they haven't gone after the soldiers. Maybe they know that there are no soldiers there. There certainly don't seem to be any soldiers there. Hmm. <laughs> and you, you, you want to know how many termites and how many ants there are. You, you, ah, oh, I would say they're probably well in excess of 20,000 ants wandering up and down here and down into the nest. There certainly were about a thousand probably termites when we started, but they're much fewer than that now. I'm going to modify what I said. I, they could well be from this mound. And what I think you find is that the term, these are the soldiers that have come out and they've come up above ground here and they've been eating the wood of this dead branch. And instead of going back home, they've stayed underneath that branch for the day. And what that's meant is that they have been ripe for the attack by these ants here. Now, India, if you want to come over here, walk this way with me and Jandre and have a look at this mound. This is, of course, the termite mound of Macrotermes natalensis. That's the fancy word we call for the mound or fungus growing mound building termite. And here it is here. You want to know how long it takes for them to build this thing? Well, there you'll read lots of different things. I have seen in the space of about, mm, say, two months, I have seen a mound go from this height up to about this height here. Now that's about sort of, whew, I don't know, about nine feet up. Okay, but remember, that's just on the top. Most of the mound is actually underneath it. Now I'm gonna ask jean to stay exactly where he is, and I'm going to walk around the mound. The mound is much bigger than the bit that you can see there. It's actually huge. So India, how long it takes them to build a mound this large could be as long as a hundred years. And remember, during that time, it's not always that there's only one queen inside the mound. The queen lays all the eggs, and she only lives for about, she lives for about 15 years or so. So if this termite mound is 100 years old, there have been a number of different queens that have lived through here. Well, I suppose just like a kingdom in the human world. Uh, Philip, you're wondering what the difference between a termite and a... Um, uh, and, uh, and an ant is. Interestingly, termites' closest relatives are cockroaches. Now, many of you will hate cockroaches, but that's the most closely related animal to a termite. Then, in terms of the ants, the most closely related animals would be wasps and bees. So they are very, very distantly related. And although they have a similar kind of movement, and um, I suppose superficially, which means on the surface, kind of, um, they look the same, they really are very, very different indeed. Righty, we've got to move away from this battle now in case we get caught in the middle of it. While we do that, let's head back to Byron and the Prince of Cats. Now, this leopard is still resting on the termite mound. And um, I, I just unfortunately can't see exactly which leopard it is just yet. So I'll wait till perhaps it moves and we can try and have a better look. But, um, you know, I always say it's just wonderful to see a leopard. Doesn't matter if we know who it is or not. It's a beautiful leopard, and that's the end of the story for me, I think. <laughs> but I know it is nice to work out which leopards are moving through the area, and it is interesting to find out who it is. Now, I know Karula, um, the dominant female in this area, did move through this area. 
and um, and she perhaps went and fetched her cubs. So I'm not sure if they if they are around, if this is perhaps one of them. Now, Kaylee, you want to know what do leopards eat? So they will feed on a large variety of foods. And um, leopards will feed on antelope, mainly antelope. So anything around the size of just a plane flying over us so anything around the size of um, a small steenbok or daker up to an impala some of the male leopards even go for much larger prey like uh, like kudu or nyala that we saw earlier so they've got a very wide variety of food that they feed on uh, Lauren, I've never seen an elephant eat an e uh, or leopard eat an elephant. Um, an elephant are far too big for leopards to hunt. However, um, if an elephant has perhaps died of natural causes or been killed by another elephant, perhaps, then it's not impossible for a leopard to go and scavenge. That means it will possibly go and eat. Um, parts of the elephant or off the carcass but in terms of killing an elephant I think that's very very rare and I've never ever heard of that happening when a leopard has killed an elephant even a young elephant because the adults would always protect it now Mylene you want to know the difference between cheetah and leopard and I'll tell you and I'll show you some pictures too. Hold on a second, let me just grab my book. And I can show you. So leopards, one of the main reasons or differences is leopards have these beautiful rosettes on them that we spoke about, that pattern, very different to that of a cheetah because a cheetah has got very prominent spots. Now let me show you again in the book. Um, well, you could see those uh, rosettes clearly on the leopard, and let me just find the, where's the cheetah here? Yeah. There we go. So the top is the, the cheetah, and you can see very clear spots. Do you see that? Also, the cheetah is much taller than a leopard, but much slimmer, so very slender. They are built for speed. They run very, very fast. Also, look at the face. You can see those very prominent dark black lines, those tear marks running down the face. Leopards do not have that. And you'll see this if you have a look at this leopard lying on the termite mound. Look at that face. You can see it's very different to that of a cheetah. No black marks moving down. Gus, um, leopards and cheetah are only related in that they are big cats, but they, they're not part of the same genus or species. And now that becomes quite difficult. Um, that's very scientific. Um, and it's all how they fit into nature and their genetic makeup. And like I said, it gets very, very complicated. So technically, no, they're not. They're not related, but they are big cats. But the cheetah are very different to the leopard. The leopards generally are ambush predators, so they m move through very, very thick areas and try and hunt. And whereas cheetah prefer open areas, plains, where they can run down their prey and use their speed. The cheetah is the fastest land mammal. Now, Nick, you want to know how big can leopards get? Now, leopards can get to, a, um, a female leopard, for example, can get to about 30 or 40 kilograms, which is about 90 pounds, maybe 100 pounds, a big one. Um, whereas a male leopard can get double that. So um, about 180, 190 pounds. Now this one again, I'm just trying to have a good look um, to see if this is a female or if it's a young male. I, ca I still can't see properly. Very difficult with them lying on a termite mound. But it's so comfortable. Look at that, really enjoying the top of the termite mound. And Joshua H, you want to know how big are the leopard's ears and do they have very good hearing? They do indeed, Joshua. They, um, 
their sense of hearing is incredible. Now, it's hard to describe how big a leopard's ears are, but if I have to show you, if, um, if you look at me, so about almost the same size as my ear, probably about that, that big, um, the leopard's ears. So they use that and they can turn their ears so they can listen very, very carefully for any movement, any animals they might want to try and hunt. So their sense of hearing is very, very good. Uh, it looks so comfortable up there, doesn't it? Uh, now, Joshua L, you want to know how fast can a leopard run? And Joshua, uh, leopards, leopards are very fast. They're very quick. They can cover, for example, um, if you have a look at how far this leopard is from us, so it's about um, how far? 20 meters. Also, if you can, you can have a look and see. Now that that leopard, if it wanted to, can cover this distance in about one or two seconds. That's how quick they are if they're charging. Very, very quick animals. Um, but they're not built for long distance sprinting. They usually it's a short burst of speed, and then they and then they um, usually give up if something's running away from them. Not like a cheetah who will run a fair distance at top speed. Now, I'm going to sit here a little bit longer and try work out which leopard this is. While I do that, let's head over to Jamie and see what she has got. Hello and welcome to Rowan Elementary, but don't tear your eyes away from the screen. Oh, I think it's just disappeared. Nope, there's the tip of its tail. This is an animal that is so exciting for us to see and your timing could not be perfect. Sorry, everybody. Um, it's Rowan Primary School. So welcome to Rowan Primary School. We're starting off with one of the rarest creatures that you can see on these live safaris. So I'm a little bit overexcited because we hardly ever get to see them. It is called a genet. Now hold on a moment because Brian, cannot put it on camera so let's let's reposition and we'll see if we can't have a chance to get a closer look at one of the most amazing animals take a deep breath my name is Jamie this afternoon I have Brian on camera with me and we are sitting in the middle of the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa and to be more specific in a place called Juma Private Game Reserve which is in so we're right up in the top northeastern corner of South Africa so right at the bottom of the, the African continent, right up in the top northeastern corner. And I don't really want to tear my eyes away from this, so hold on one moment. Let's see if we can see it again. Oh, goodness me, Brian. It's, it's there, behind the leaves. Okay, let's try and reposition. In other words, I'm going to drive in a little bit just to see if we can't see, because we are actually blocking up a main road, so I have to move off the road anyway. So let me see if we can't get a little bit closer and maybe see what it is. Now, a, a genet looks a little bit like somebody crossed a ferret with a snake. Ah, not a snake, a cat. I don't know where a snake came from. Looks a little bit like somebody crossed a ferret with a, with a cat. And they are very secretive animals. They only come out at night, which is why it's quite unusual to see one right in the middle of our afternoon. And let me try. Oh, come on. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Deary me. Let's see if we can't get a position that... Ryan can get you in there. I can't see it at all. Let's do one more scan of the tree. I'll turn off the engine so we don't shake too much. Where, oh where, could the spotted Janet be hiding? Oh dear, unluckily I think we might have missed it which is just the way of things out here. We are in a place where the animals are 100% wild. So it's not like a zoo, it's, it's, it's not like an enclosure. These animals live in a massive area, uh, a park that is larger than the size, or a reserve that is larger than the size of whales quite a little bit larger than the size of whales. So it is a really, really massive area with no fences and the animals are completely wild, which means that sometimes we don't always get to see them. Where did you go? 
And Emma, you want to, oh, you did get to see a tail. I'm so thrilled. I'm glad that you got to see the spots of the Janet's tail. You want to know how often we see Janet's. Um, I would guess and say, what would you say, Brian? Once every two weeks, once, uh, once a month? Maybe, maybe once a month, I think, would probably be a good description of how often we see them. I have to be honest, completely honest with you, we actually saw one this morning with breakfast uh, because it was living in the roof over our heads. So we did see one at breakfast this morning. And they are an animal that gets used to the presence of people, it gets used to the presence of people moving about. It also learns very cleverly that it can actually scavenge from the dinner table or the breakfast table. Once everybody leaves, the genet will come down from from the roof and grab it whatever they can find so they're very very good climbers and as i said quite secretive i suspect that the reason that this one was in the tree was because it was it saw a leopard because i was actually here to look for a leopard not for a genet now Lida, you wanted to know when is the genet's breeding season hi guys Good, thanks. How are you? Sorry, everybody. I just have to have a quick chat. There was a Janet up here, but I can't find it now. I think he's climbed down and run away. Okay. Cool. Oh, where? Oh, awesome. Thanks very much. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Cheers, guys. Sorry everybody, I was just had to have a conversation with one of the other guides. I'm going to do something quickly and let's just see if I hop out, maybe I can see them. So as I said, they're like a mixture between a cat and a ferret and they are, it should be relatively easy to see if it hasn't gone into the ground and run away. Oh goodness. Let me just see if it is still here. I think it's given us this slip. I think it's run away. I don't know how it has, but somehow it has. It might even have jumped into one of the neighboring trees. So they can jump. They are good climbers, so there's a good chance that it might have jumped into one of the other trees and then moved away from where we are. Okay, let's try and do this gracefully. Back into the car. Okay. So yes, let's try that all again. A very warm welcome to all of you watching at the primary school. And I hope you're excited to go on a live safari. There's all sorts of things you could see. You could see leopards, you could see lions. It's, it's a magical, magical place out here. And of course, it's not just about the leopards and the lions. We also see really interesting insects, really interesting small things. And I think what I'm going to do, because it's hot this afternoon, is I'm going to go and check out the local water holes and see whether there isn't anything that's come across it to have a drink. Ow! Our Janet was pretty good at climbing trees, so good that it actually disappeared. But I do know somebody else who's very good at climbing trees and he would like to say hello, so let's go and have a look. Hello everybody, here I am, my name is James Jandre is on camera and I'm standing in a very, very large tree. Now the very first thing that you saw over here was a leopard orchid, and that, sorry, a leopard, <laughs> and in a tree I think, that over there, the reason I've climbed up this tree is to show you a leopard orchid. Now an orchid is a kind of a plant that lives on another plant, it's called an epiphyte, and an epiphyte is a plant that lives on another plant, but it doesn't do the other plant any harm. Now this leadwood tree is very long dead. It's been dead for a very long time. It's very dense wood. And I must say, I'm quite scared hanging all the way up here. Jandre said to me, you have to go up there. And I was too scared to tell him no. So I came all the way up here and now I'm looking at this and I can see the whole of this beautiful, beautiful landscape here. Off to the east, I'm facing towards Towards Mozambique in the east and the Indian Ocean, behind me the great Drakensberg mountain range of South Africa 
down to the south you may have heard of Cape Town that's off in that direction there and up to the north over there the rest of Africa Zimbabwe is the next country then Zambia and then probably Tanzania and then Kenya and then all the other beautiful countries of Africa stretching north all the way to the Mediterranean Sea and you guys of course are in the States I think in America which means you are pretty much in that direction there where I'm pointing off to the north West. Isn't that amazing that we're all connected on one planet like this? Now, apparently you're all telling me to be very careful. Ah, you don't even need to tell me that once. I'm being very, very careful. I'm quite nervous. Anyway, I was hoping to try and get a piece Oh, there was a bird flying by them. I was hoping to get a piece of this leopard orchid because apparently they're quite nice to eat. Now I've broken off one or two in my time and bitten them and chewed them and they don't taste so good. But I will tell you a special local legend about them. And that legend goes like this. When you are lonely and perhaps you know a girl or a boy that you quite like but they don't really like you, what you do is you come and you get a piece of that tree, of this funny little plant, and you chew it at full moon. It has to be at full moon. And then at midnight you quickly get out of your bed and you go and you spit it out <laughs> and you say the name of the one you like and she will immediately, or he, will immediately start thinking about you. So remember that when the time comes for you to go a-courting, as they say. Now, Delilah, you're wondering, I think it's Delilah, you're wondering how often these things grow in these trees. Well, as often as they can, really. But the most interesting thing, of course, is that they produce their flowers around about now. As we go towards Christmas, they produce a beautiful yellow and brown flower, and that's why they're called a leopard orchid, because it looks like a leopard's fur. They're yellow with beautiful brown spots. Marvellous. Now, I have to try and get out of this tree now, so it could be quite extreme television that you're going to watch now. I hope I don't fall. If I do, my friend Aubrey is close by and he's going to help me with some first aid. He's got a whole lot of first aid equipment in case I fall out of the tree. So far we're okay. Okay, we're going to go back across to Jamie now, I think. In case I fall out, I don't want you to see that. I'll see you back on the ground, hopefully in one piece. Oh dear, I do hope that James manages to climb down the tree and unscathed. Never fear though, because this isn't the first time he's been stuck up a tree and it won't be the last. And if he does fall down, I'm sure he'll be just, well, maybe not totally fine, but I'm sure he'll be okay. Just goes to show, now be careful of climbing up trees if you don't know that you're going to be able to get down. Once or twice, we've actually seen James climb a tree and then the branch snap underneath him and he's fallen or nearly fallen out before. I hope he does, I hope that doesn't happen to him now. I hope he's picked a sensible tree. Right, let us turn in here and go and see if we can't check one of the nearby water holes. Now, I don't know whether or not you knew this and I'm going to guess that perhaps you didn't, but South Africa's been in the grips of one of its worst droughts in the last hundred years. So last year, when we should have had at least over 500 mils of rain, we had just over 150. So that is a fifth, basically, of what we should have got or just over a fifth of what we should have got. And as a result, the animals have been really struggling. And it's not just the water, it's also the fact that without any rain, the grass doesn't grow, the trees aren't growing as well, they're not as healthy. And for the animals like elephants and buffalo and zebra, all of the animals that have to feed off the plants out here, that means that they face a really, really tough situation because there's not enough food for them. Now, luckily, it has started to rain um, over the the last few weeks and the last few months so it seems as though at least the drought has lifted a little bit or at least the animals have had a bit of relief but there was a time a couple of weeks ago where we were driving around and there was no grass at all it was just dust so it's lovely to see that the grass has sprung back up However, it's been a while since we last had any rain, which means that there's not that many puddles. And it also means that that 
that when it gets hot like an, on an afternoon like this afternoon, the animals have to go and drink at water holes. So we're going to go to one of the closest water holes now and just see whether anything's coming to have a drink. And Vivian, you want to know what the rarest animal is that we've seen. The rarest animal that you can see out here is an animal called a pangolin. Now a pangolin is basically a, a scaly anteater and it essentially, I don't know if you know artichokes, you must know what an artichoke is. If you've ever seen an artichoke, a pangolin kind of looks like somebody animated a, an artichoke. So it's this tiny little brown creature with scales covering its body and it moves about catching and eating ants and it likes a particular type of ant called a pugnacious ant. Now the reason that pangolins are so rare is actually really very sad. First of all they're secretive and they only come out at night but even worse is that their scales are thought to have some kind of medicinal property and it's not true they don't. Their scales are basically the same thing that your hair and your fingernails are made of but what it means is that pangolin have been been terribly poached and shipped illegally across the world where they've been used in traditional medicine and that's terribly sad because they're such a special animal and there's no truth at all it's much like the situation with rhino horn it is utterly tragic okay we're just going to come up to the waterhole now Now Vivian, you want to know what sort of meat we eat in the camp and if it is unusual. Not particularly Vivian, so the mainly the, the, the meats that we get would be beef and pork and chicken. The, the standard meats that you might expect uh, on a menu anywhere in the world. There are however, occasionally there's times where venison is ordered and it will be South African venison. So it will be things like an impala or a kudu or warthog. It's venison that's been purchased from the butchery so there are a few members of camp that will eat venison and especially eat venison so yes we do sometimes get the more unusual types of meat and we're at a waterhole called Red Dam I'm just stopping to see whether anybody's home but unfortunately it doesn't look like it and the only things that are home are all swimming about over there in the form of terrapins. Uh, every now and again, look there, see, there's a head. Uh, all of them popping up. I have to admit, I was hoping, um, although I'm very glad to see some terrapins in this particular waterhole. A terrapin is a mixture between a tortoise and a turtle, by the way. And I was hoping that perhaps some elephants might be coming down to drink. Lucy, you want to know, is it true that elephants will eat salt or go after salt? Yes, that is absolutely 100%. Ooh. Let's try not to roll into the waterhole. It is absolutely 100% true. So elephants do like salt. Actually, a lot of animals like salt. And in certain areas, what they'll do is people will put out what's known as a salt lick, which is a big block of salt. And the animals will come and lick at it because obviously the minerals that are in salt are important in all of our bodies, our bodies, animals' bodies, as a different things, whether it's because it's for your nerves or your muscles or your the rest of your body. They need those minerals. Now, if there's no salt licks, what do you think the elephants do? There's only one thing they can really do, and that's to go and find salty rock and lick it. Now, antelope will go and lick it. Elephants will actually kick it until it breaks because the salty rock is usually quite soft. Then they'll grab it with their trunk and they'll put it in their mouths and they'll eat dirt. It's called, the, the official name for it is called geophagy, which means the process of eating dirt. And they do it specifically for salt. What's amazing about elephants, and this is a story I'm sure many of you will have heard, is the fact that elephants have such amazing memories. They know where to go and they know where to find the best salt. That's what I always find incredible. Okay, let's go see what else we can find. Oh, 
out here. It's been a little bit quiet on my side. All of the animals, including that Janet, have been hiding away from me. But it seems as though Byron has had slightly better luck. Better luck. So let's head over to him for a surprise. We're still sitting with this beautiful leopard, and we've had a closer look. This is a young male leopard, and and a very good afternoon to Rowan Primary School. Lovely to have all of you with us. Don't forget to send us your questions. Now, I've been sitting with this leopard for quite a while. It's a young male leopard. Um, we think, oh, well, I know he's just under a year old, and I'm not sure where his mother is at the moment. She sometimes leave, leaves these young leopards to go off and hunt, provide food for them. Now, he has got a sibling, a female, in fact. So it's a young male and female. I don't know where she is. She's possibly with the mother somewhere, and I've got a feeling they're somewhere in this area. I'm not too sure where though. This young male has been spending a lot of time um, on his own, not far from the mother, but he's been lying up on termite mounds and in trees, kind of exploring a little bit as young males do. But we are so lucky to be able to see them and spend time with them because they are very elusive and that just means that they're very difficult to find they can hide very very well and they can disappear in a bush very quickly if they don't want to be seen but fortunately this young male is very comfortable with us being around him at the moment <laughs> Lily, you want to know if leopards eat something that's got dirt on it, so maybe they've killed uh, or hunted an impala and it's got dirt on it, would the dirt be bad for them? No, probably not. I don't think so. I think a little bit of sand it might just give them a, a bit of nutrients <laughs> and, and a bit of salt. You know, some of the salt, uh, some of the sand is a little salty. And for some of these animals, it's not a not a bad thing if they do eat some of the soil. But uh, but I think you know, in general, it won't be covered in dirt. It won't be covered in mud or anything. But I've seen leopards go and hunt animals out of mud. Um, so if they really have to, they'll eat some of it. But obviously, try and avoid it if there's too much on it. But a bit of sand or dirt, it won't make too much of a difference for them. It's a lovely, cool afternoon. And I think because of this cool weather, that's why that leopard's so happy of lying out in the open for us. Now, Rosie, you want to know how long are leopards pregnant for? So leopards, female leopards, are pregnant for about 90 days, so three months. And that's all it takes for them to give birth to these beautiful little cubs. And then what happens is they usually hide them in a den site because when those cubs are born, they're completely helpless. They're blind and they rely completely on the female. So the female will hide them in a den site, usually a rocky area or an area where there's very thick bush. So other animals can't get to them. They can hide in there. And, um, and then about a, a month, month and a half, she may move them perhaps to another den site and maybe from two months. Um, if you're lucky, you might get them walking around a little bit with the mother, but um, they will still be very vulnerable and she will have to look after them. Oh, uh, Harriet, now you've asked an interesting question. You want to know, what is a leopard's best sense? Uh, now, Harriet, I think, if I had to guess, I would say leopard's best sense is probably their sense of smell, I think. And I'll tell you why I say that. Their eyesight is incredible, their hearing is incredible, but I think their sense of smell, being able to find other leopards, to be able to find food, they can pick up on the scent of anything that's walked in the area, and it, I think that is probably their best sense. Very, very good. Much better than ours, that's for sure.
Caitlin, you want to know what is the age of the oldest leopard that I know? So, Caitlin, um, I was fortunate, fortunate enough to see an old leopard that got to about 18. That was the oldest leopard I saw and that I know of. Um, about 18 years old, that leopard unfortunately is dead now. That was uh, about a year or two ago we saw her. And um, a very, very old leopard. But um, generally their age is about 17. They get to about 17. Ah, Serena, very good question. You say, is it true that we can identify the leopards by their spots uh, close to their whiskers? And we can indeed, but it takes a lot of time and effort um, to really have a good look. And you do need binoculars and you need to zoom in. But if you look just above that whisker line, there's a very straight line of dots that are joined. Um, and then just above it, you can see one, two, three little dots. Can you see that over there? And then on the other side, they've also got it. So each leopard's dots or spot pattern above the whiskers is unique. Now this is a young male leopard we know as Hosa uh, Hosanna. Um, and we recognize him because we've been seeing him quite a lot with his, with his mother, who is a dominant leopard in this area. Um, but it is difficult. And to be honest, I really just enjoy seeing leopards. It doesn't matter which one it is. It's nice for us to keep track of who is in the area and who's moving around. But, um, but it's nice to just see them and appreciate them, no matter who it is. And Lucy, you want to know, are the baby leopards born with spots and little rosettes? Yes, Lucy, they are. So those patterns on the leopard are known as rosettes. And they do have spots down the legs and that. But the rosette is not a hold spot. Um, but uh, they are born with that. And then as they get older, those rosettes become a lot clearer. And the spots become a lot clearer too down the legs and that. I'm going to sit with this young leopard a little bit longer. But while I do that, let's head back over to my friend James, who's still walking about. I'm just kidding. I got out of the tree absolutely fine, everybody, so don't worry about it. Now, we had a quick question from Lucy, who wanted to know, do they only grow in dead trees? I think that was the question about the leopard orchid. The answer is no. They often grow in living trees, but they quite like those dead ones as well, especially trees where there's a bit of a hole in the middle of the branch there. So that was a dead tree, and because it's been dead a long time, can you see how hard the wind is blowing? Because it's a dead tree, it's got the soft wood in the middle of the tree. It's got a little bit soft and sometimes fungus gets inside there and that makes it much easier for the orchid to grow. Now I've got another interesting plant here to show you. This is called leopard orchid. No, it's not. It's <laughs> It's called a baboon's tail. And the baboon's tail, everybody, is called a baboon's tail because it looks like a baboon's tail. But what's interesting as we watch the storm sort of approaching us is these leaves. These leaves yesterday were green. They were bright, bright green. But as soon as the water starts to sort of go away from the surface of the earth, they go brown immediately. And as soon as the water comes, so this at all. It will bring up water, suck the water and it will go green. I'm not sure how much of that you got. Sorry about that everybody. But what would happen is that the water would be sucked up out of the ground into this funny little plant and these will immediately go green and then it will produce beautiful purple flowers. Now, we're going to start heading for home mainly because the weather's starting to look a bit nasty and we don't want to be on foot if it gets too dark and stormy. This hat here fell off Jandre. Let's put it back on his head. Thank you, James. And on we go. 
Lily, you're wondering if we've ever been attacked while walking or in the car. The answer, Lily, is sometimes yes. But remember that it's very unusual that we should be attacked by anything, Lily. And also, it's very important to understand that animals... <laughs> Andre keeps losing his hat. We'll just put it on the end of my stick. Remember that it's very unusual for you to be attacked and the only reason an animal would attack us is if it was very scared of us because they see us as very scary. Animals out here, even that big buffalo you saw, even the leopard that you saw today or the leopards that you saw today and the elephants, they are scared of us. And so anything that attacks us is saying, please go away, I'm really afraid of you. It does happen from time to time, but really it's not often that it happens at all. Right, we're going to walk up this way. Let's see what else we can find through here, other than Jandre's hat, which is now stuck behind me. Hmm. Now, what was through here earlier, we would expect to find something like an impala. Now, impala are our most common antelope, and they like to move in areas like this because if Jandre moves the camera from side to side, you can see quite a long way. You see that, that's very important. If you want to avoid a predator, you need to be able to see quite far. So the impala like to avoid the lions and the leopards and the wild dogs and the cheetahs and all those sorts of things. And so they like to live in these sorts of areas. But also, because it's windy, you'll find that all of the antelope species and the animals that eat grass, they will be up into the clearings where they can see a long way because of course you know that when wind blows, it makes the trees go whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. So if I was a predator and I was walking slowly like this, remember that if it's very still and there's no rain or there's no wind, if I stand on a stick, going to make a noise. But if I stand on a stick when it's blowing like this, well, then we don't have a problem because no animal is going to hear it over the sound of the wind. Now, Serena, you're wondering if we live in the Kruger. Well, we live in the western fringes of the what we call the Greater Kruger Park. So it's all part of one big area, but our little area here is called Juma, and Juma is part of the Greater Kruger National Park, which in turn is part of a bigger area called the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. You don't have to remember that, but what you need to remember is that it's a very, very big area. Eight and a half million acres. Isn't that huge? That's massive. That's three times the size of Yellowstone National Park. That's poor old, poor old genre stepping over things. Delilah, you say, don't I get very scared walking around? Delilah, you know, I used to, before I knew what to do here, before I was trained uh, by men like Aubrey, then I used to get scared, but I don't anymore. I'm very careful though. And we often get asked this question, Delilah, and the best way to answer it is, is like this. Can you imagine if somebody from here who had never seen a car before. Imagine they got dropped in the middle of New York City. Now you know how many cars and people there are there. Can you imagine how afraid that person would be and how dangerous it would be? They wouldn't know how to cross a road. They wouldn't know how to cross a train, at least to get on a train. They wouldn't know um, how to avoid um, dangerous areas, they wouldn't know where to find food, how to get food, and that's exactly the same as when you come into an area like this. When I arrived here, I'd come from the city. I didn't know what was dangerous and what wasn't. I didn't know how to make sure that I didn't make the animals scared of me. And so slowly over time, I've learnt all of those things. And so I don't feel so scared anymore. And it's largely through guys like Aubrey, who's walking in front of us there, that I have learnt these lessons. Guys like Aubrey and my friend Elvis, who used to, he was my first teacher out here. He taught me about living in the bush, about how to be with animals, how to not make them afraid of us. And so that's how I've managed to stay safe. And the other thing, Delilah, very important, is that you have to be very careful all the time. Leela, you know, this is also a very common question. It is hot here, and you say, how do we celebrate Christmas when it's so hot here? Leela, I can't imagine celebrating Christmas where it's cold. Isn't that strange? Because I've grown up here, I don't know what snow is like. I've never had a Christmas in the snow. And um, for me, Christmas is summertime. For you, Christmas is wintertime. But here, it's summer. And so I don't really know how to do it the way you guys do it in the snow.
Uh, we go to the beach and we swim in the sea often for Christmas time, so we don't go outside and build snowmen. Isn't that interesting? It's just a different way of doing things. <laughs> and Emma, while we walk through here looking carefully for animals, you want to know how long I've been a guide for? Well, Emma, I've been around this area for about 10 or 11 years or so. Watch out, Jandre, there's a very large tree there. And Emma, 10 or 11 years is quite a long time, especially if you're only eight or nine years old. That's more than your lifetime, of course. Um, but that's quite a long time to be out here. And it's, but it's still not nearly enough time to learn all that there is to know. There's so much to learn out here, like about these flowers. This is the beautiful flower of Acacia exuvialis. And Acacia exuvialis, or the uh, flaky thorn, smells like oranges. You smelt an orange? That's what this smells like. It's delicious. All right, Zara, uh, you had a question for me and it was... I've forgotten. Sorry, Zara, I've forgotten. Oh yes, what my favorite animal is. My favorite animal, Zara, is a wild dog. Now that's like the wolf of Africa. They're my favorite because they're friendly. We can view them on foot. Uh, we can't touch them, but they're quite friendly and they're quite nice. All right, kids, we're gonna go away now. Well, you're gonna go away now. We're gonna carry on walking that way. And hopefully we'll see you again on safari soon. Thank you for your questions. They've all been so clever and so brilliant. And hopefully we'll see you again on safari soon. Bye-bye. So he's still sitting with this beautiful young male leopard and look how he's just put his neck all the way down. It doesn't look very comfortable, does it? But he appears to be comfortable. And he's really enjoying it. Now, I'm not entirely sure when this leopard's going to decide to move. He's probably going to lie here, well, anywhere for another five minutes or five hours. Who knows? It, it really depends. It also depends if the female comes back and calls him, um, if she perhaps has a kill for him to feed on. But he's been resting here, it looks like, for quite some time. And he's very comfortable up there. No need for him to move around too much. I think what happened was, I think this female had a kill early this morning. And she went and fetched these two young cubs and brought them back to the area where the kill was. They may have fed. I'm not sure how much of the kill was left. I don't know. We, I didn't see it. But, um, but... It's amazing that they will move during the day and a lot of people, I was mentioning it earlier, how people think leopards generally move around at night, um, but they do move during the day. They just can be very elusive if they want to. I think um, what I'm going to do is, we've had such a wonderful afternoon with this leopard. He's been very good to us and resting on the termite mound. Probably going to leave him. Um, and maybe what I'll do is I'm going to check this area very carefully. Just see if I can't find any sign of the female, or the two females, the adult and the young female. See if they are in this area. I, I do think they, they are, but they could be anywhere. They could be anywhere. They could be down in a thick drainage line somewhere. So I'm not sure. So I'll have a look around and see. Now, Joshua Lang, you want to know how big is a leopard's territory? So, uh, uh, Joshua, the um, the young males, or males, so not necessarily young males, but the males, big dominant males, can have territories that are oh, uh, between 10 and 20 square kilometers. It also depends on the area that they are in. You know, some leopards in part, parts of Africa where the... Where the um, the density of leopards is very low. They will have much larger territories. And there have been um, leopards that have been 
collared for research purposes that have been monitored and their movements and some of them that have moved for, um, oh, a few hundred kilometers um, to move into different areas but generally speaking a male leopard between 10 and 20 kilometers and a female a bit smaller than that maybe between between five square kilometers and 15 square kilometers so uh, fairly large areas but it, it does depend it also depends on the amount of competition around how much space is there to move are there other leopards that are encroaching on their territory so there are a number of factors which need to be taken into account Right, so it looks like this leopard is very, very comfy and not interested in moving just yet. So why don't we give him his space and see if we can't find the female around here, or the females. Um, both of them, they're possibly in the same area. So I'm going to try to move out of the sighting now. And while I do that, let's head back to Jamie and get an update from her. Now, it's wonderful news that Hosanna is still in the area, but we're all keeping our fingers crossed now that he manages to find his mom or his sister once again. Silly boy, he's been out wandering, and he's taken himself a little far from, a little far from mom and sister. Oh, in the meantime, we have come all the way to the western boundary of Arethusa. And we're just doing some tests on our radios, making sure everything's working out just fine. And of course, it's always nice to come through and have a look at what's happening here. We've got some very, very pregnant impala. Now, earlier on before the, the or with the schools, uh, we didn't go into it in too much detail, of course, because they've got such limited time spent with us. But we were on the search for shadow. Oh. Big yawn. I suppose it's exhausting being that pregnant. Um, but yes, we did go and search for Shadow. I was desperate to see her. I haven't spent much time with her. What are you doing, girl? I wonder if there's not something irritating her, her mouth or her nose that's causing that yawning. Or maybe she's just a bit tired, feeling a bit run down. Yes, yeah, she is using the bottom teeth as a comb to comb through her fur. Now for those of you that missed the sunrise safari, there is actually a connection between a shadow and the impala that we're looking at. Hold on a second, there is something irritating her face. She's got an abscess on her cheek or some kind of a swelling. I don't know what, unfortunately I don't think she's going to let us get a closer look, but just look at the bulge close to her cheek. Sure, interesting. Right, sorry, I was talking about Shadow and the fact that this morning, for those of you who missed the sunrise safari, apparently, Brian, it was a baby impala. Yeah. Yeah, apparently she had a, a baby impala kill and she was in a very, very dense area, sort of a Tamburti thicket. So Brian led me back to where the, where she was left this morning and I went and I had a look. Because the last time with, uh, that I saw her, I didn't actually get to spend any time with her and unfortunately we had to leave. And I would really, really like to catch up with Shadow once again. Unfortunately, she has pulled a complete disappearing act. I have no doubt that she's somewhere hidden in that thicket, uh, but I went for a walk. I couldn't, I couldn't find her. I couldn't find tracks. She's somewhere in there. The question is just where about is she? Is that rain, Brian? I, I felt a drop, I feel. Mm-hmm. I think it's safe to say that it is indeed rain on its way. That's good news. I wonder how much they go it's going to come. Lovely. For our new viewers, we always rejoice at any kind of even one drop of rain, just because it's better than nothing and we had such a bad rainy season last rainy season. So Byron, it sounds like Byron and Viam are busy putting on their rain covers, so we'll continue on for now. And then we will, as soon as they, we have a moment, then we will put on ours as well. Because I must say, they're starting to look, the skies are starting to look a little heavy. And I, as much as I would love to check the western boundary of Arethusa, let me just check I haven't strayed into Elephant Plains because that would be quite tragic. Yes, I was, a... <laughs> I was almost about to. That is rain. 
That is definitely rain. Um, I think we might have to cut our explorations of the west. Oh, the western boundary short because the storm is coming and I think it's time we started heading closer to home. Even the Impala don't really want to be seen. They are running away from us. I'm going to keep moving because I'm now feeling a little pressured. This wind is suddenly making me feel as though I'm about to have a repeat of the Cheetah Plains situation where I, I thought it wasn't going to rain. It did. It really rained. It rained a lot. I was soaking. <laughs> so was so was Jandre, and we still had a very long way to get home. So we better start. Oh goodness! Uh oh! No, we've got to. No, we've got to. We've got to put the the rain cover on. At least the camera cover. It's now actually starting to come down. Sorry. Uh oh. Oh, here it is. There we go. Okay, this needs to be a hurried situation. We're going to do it quickly. In the meantime, we'll send you over to Byron. Well, <laughs> while Jamie gets wet, or hopefully she doesn't get too wet out there with the rain, um, we are cruising along and just having a look around to see if we get any sign of the other leopards. But it is very thick in this area and there's a lot of space for them to hide in. So I'm not sure where the female could be. It's anywhere around here perhaps. Lovely sighting. Also like to see if we can't find those elephants again. If they are around. Ah, uh, some Inyala to male Inyala. They are <laughs> such beautiful antelope. Oh, look at that long hairy coat blowing in the wind. Lovely to see the Nyala. They do prefer the thicker areas and that's why they're walking around here. They prefer browsing of branches around these drainage lines. There's another one, there's a third one. Looks like they're just walking away from us. Nice to see them though. No females around them. And remember, uh, those of you who watched this morning, we got to see males doing their wonderful display, that uh, dominance display, but that's because there were probably females in the area. We actually saw the females later, but these ones, and as I said, well today, this morning, I was telling you how you you can get males in these small bachelor herds, these small bachelor groups, but uh, and they don't mind each other. As soon as females are around, then all of a sudden they want to do, um, be dominant over the other ones and chase the other males away so they can potentially mate with the females. It's amazing how these big elephant can just disappear. We had, oh, those weren't really massive elephant we saw earlier. They were two young males. But it's funny how they can. Sorry, Tormant, I was just trying to listen to your question there. Um, what was the antelope you wanted to know that are related to Inyala? Onyx. Um, what? I've never heard of an onyx. What is an onyx? I'd have to look that up. Is, is it an antelope found? Is it an antelope at least? Never heard of an onyx. Is it oryx perhaps? I don't know. We have oryx in Africa. Okay, so, <laughs> all right, so the oryx, yes, um, we do have oryx in Africa, uh, also known as the Gemsbok, a very difficult name to pronounce, Gemsbok, 
But no, the Chemsbok are not related to the Nyala at all, other than they are another antelope species. And I'll try to show all of you what the Oryx looks like. We don't get them in this area. They prefer semi-arid to desert areas. Uh, that's a bird book. That's not going to help me at all. Let's have a look here. Now the Oryx have got beautiful long horns. There we go. Let me show you. That's the Oryx in the top. Beautiful antelope. And this, I would have to say, is my favorite antelope. I love them. They're just so beautiful. Those are long, sharp horns. And you can see this picture was taken in the Kalahari, um, an area where it's mostly desert, desert to semi-arid region. Very, very dry and very, very hot. And these antelope are adapted for those conditions. So we don't get them out in this area. But they are not related to the Nyala at all. Other than, like I said, other than they are also antelope. So let's see what else we can find this afternoon. Wonderful leopard sighting. Ah, uh, now... James is still out in the bush wandering about, but he seems to be a little under the weather. That is an appalling, appalling joke, Byron. Under the weather. I thought it was funny. You thought it was funny, did you? Well, you would, wouldn't you? Right, over here. <laughs> We have a lady, a lady marula tree, and she has produced her fruits. Now these are quite early fruits, and so they're not going to taste very nice, I don't think. Do you like that angle, Chandra? Yes. But we are going to give them a little taste, just to test, because the taste of a ripe marula is substantially better than the taste of an unripe marula. Anyway, they will be ripe hopefully by the end of this month, going into January. Yeah, that's not going to be very good. We had an extremely poor marula season last year, and the reason we had that poor marula season, of course, was a lack of water. There's been a bit more water now. I'm getting quite hopeful. This one is, well, that one's rotten, so we won't be eating that. <laughs> Go on. No, I'm not going to eat that, Chandra. I, unlike you, I'm not prepared to eat absolutely anything that's put in front of me. Now, we're coming up onto quarantine clearings, hoping to see if there's a mammal there. I haven't shown you one mammal today on foot, but given the wind, I'm rather hoping there might be an impala or two. That was Chandra falling in a hole, not me. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't see... Yes, I do. Impala. There we are, Jean-Dri. Turn around. Way in the distance I can see some Impala and hopefully some Impala lambs. Now, as we walk slowly towards them, and we'll see how close we can get. The wind is not good for us. I will demonstrate the wind by means of the sock that I received when I was at a wedding. There we go. The wind is blowing straight towards them. And as we walk towards them with this poor wind, let us take time, for those of you who didn't see this morning's drive, to just reminisce slightly about the morning that Jean-Dre, Aubrey and I had today. Jean-Dre is grinning like a Cheshire cat as we speak. This because we spent 45 minutes on foot alone with Shongile and she came from about 30 meters away, 100 feet or so, towards us, climbed up a tree just 8 meters, that is times 3, about 25 feet from where I was sitting. She climbed up into the tree and there she sat and she watched us for half an hour. It was a sublime connection with the heart of the wild. Did you like that, John? It was dramatic enough. No. No. I'll try it again later. There, the impala again. Let's walk slowly towards them. You can hear the wind, I'm sure. No rain yet. I told Jean Dre categorically that it was not going to rain today, just before the radio call came through that Jamie and Byron were, in fact, putting their rain covers on. 
So we've come on to quarantine because we don't have too much time left for the walk and also we can run for home if we have to. I just want to see how close we can get to those little things. And the reason I was waffling on about Shongile was that, of course, a baby impala is going to react in a totally different way. It's not going to want us to be anywhere near it. It's not going to show any form of inquisitiveness. It's just going to show fear. And I think they will just run away from us. Now, I'm walking straight towards the ewes and wondering if they're going to pick up our scent. I mean, they must have smelt us by now. The wind is blowing straight towards them. And we'll go towards the termite mound first, and then we'll go and see if we can't get to a position where we can view these impala. There we are, we've been spotted. Aubrey's going around this termite mound. We're gonna go over the top of it. And then I'll show you a little bit about what's going on with the weather and why I don't think it's going to rain properly. I'm afraid they're kind of moving off. We'll keep trying sort of to go towards them, but if we look down over there, there is the way the weather is coming from, that is southeast. And I think that's looking quite bright, so I don't think it's going to rain on us. Chandra would like to disagree. Now, James Richard, apparently it is today the um, World Soil Day. How you know that, I could not begin to tell you. But anyway, well done for knowing it. And you say, would you like, you'd like an interesting fact about the soil? Well, about this soil that we're sitting on here, I can tell you that it is granite based and that means that it is very sandy, it is fairly nutrient free and of course because of this nutrient free soil it's one of the major reasons that this area has been declared a wildlife area because you cannot do agriculture here. People have tried. They've run cattle on this land, they have tried to plant crops on this land, they've tried to dig beneath the surface to find gold, none of which has resulted in any kind of sort of um, economic activity and that's why it was given over to wildlife. Little did they know it would become some of the most valuable real estate in South Africa and of course ultimately that is down to the fact that it is a nutrient poor granite based sandy soil. There you are James Richard, that is your number of soil facts for today. I'm going to try and get a little bit closer to these impalas. I was expecting a great swathe of mammal life up here but unfortunately, there are none. There, they're starting to run, Jandri. All heading down towards the pan, where they might have a bit of a drink, probably just a graze, without the smell of predatory humans on their noses. Okay, Byron is still knocking about the place. I'm sure he's got his rain covers on now. We're going to probably head pretty close to home. Might see you once more, but until then, see what Byron has to tell you from his under the weatherness. So I am trying to tempt fate a little bit. I'm not putting rain covers on just yet. Um, I think it might miss us. Let's see, I'm not sure. But uh, who knows, who knows, I'm playing, living life on the edge, not putting rain covers on just yet. What a rebel. <laughs> uh, we'll see, we'll see what happens, we'll see what happens. I was just saying it is such a wonderful afternoon because it's so much cooler than yesterday. I think I did fry a little bit. I was cooking slowly in this vehicle. I think I was just on simmer. It was very, very hot yesterday afternoon. But it's changed now and this cool weather, overcast weather is fantastic and definitely very, very welcome. have a look um, scanning these areas for potentially those elephants so while we drive through these this area well, you can scan with us and have a look at the wonderful landscape and, um, and you can also get a look at those clouds. I mean, those clouds are amazing. Just, and have a look from where you are now, and Vian will try his best while I drive just to show you 
little bit of the um, the area to our left because the clouds are much much darker in that direction that area now what I'm going to try to do is just stop around here and listen out for those elephants for a section or oh, for a short little while but actually have a look here this is wonderful I wonder if you can see it so off to our left now you can actually see the Drakensberg mountain range in the distance just below that cloud cover and um, it's a little clear and I think because of the rain the rain often makes the air so much clearer that we can see that mountain range very clearly and the other morning it looked like that mountain range had almost moved closer to us it was so clear it's a bit hazy there at the moment and I wonder if there isn't a bit of rain in front of those clouds I mean in front of those mountains there's a beautiful mountain range and that area that we are looking at now is known as the Blyder River Canyon now an interesting fact and that is the third largest canyon in the world so the largest canyon obviously the Grand Canyon in the United States and then it is the Fish River Canyon which is also in southern Africa up in Namibia and then it is the Blyder River Canyon this one which is up in the northeastern part of South Africa the third largest canyon in the world however it is the greenest so it has the most vegetation it is it has the most water flowing through there so it is a beautiful beautiful area and I've been fortunate enough to actually take guests on helicopter through that area and view the canyon from helicopter it really really is incredible what a wonderful view and I can't hear any elephant but it's also now that I think about it it's become very very windy so I'm not sure we are going to hear them if they are moving around maybe if we look in this area over here I thought I saw a cuckoo flying through here I may be wrong let's just scan and have a look sometimes you get a fleeting glimpse of one that might fly from tree to tree um, let's just keep a good look out here seems to have flown off I don't see it at all anymore and so that's typical cuckoo behavior very very quick glimpse of it and it moves off um, that's why well, when we do see these cuckoos it's wonderful to see them I'm approaching our northern boundary at the moment our Biffles Hook cut line and I might end, end up driving past Biffles Hook Dam just to have a look if there's any activity around there. And you can see why they call it a cut line, a very, very straight road. All right, now I'm going to head towards the dam. While I do that, let's head back to James and get an update from him. <laughs> I found something quite interesting here, everybody, and I thought, gosh, that's a very unusual stone to find over here. I wonder how it got here. And then Aubrey said, well, it's probably come from some of the building at uh, the camps. It's a beautiful white stone and we'll take it home with us because actually I suppose it must be some, whoops, sorry, it must be some form of litter. All right, let's put it in our pockets. Okay, then over here, we've got a baboon spider, the tarantula. And we're not going to pull him out of his hole here. We're going to leave him be exactly where he is. But just to tell you that this one is about an inch and a bit across. And so the baboon spider itself is probably nearly the size of my palm. So a fairly enormous fellow. 
now it's getting quite dark you can see and that means of course that many of the flowers and things that are around here normally which would be open have stopped being open they've all closed up for the night one of them being this gorgeous thing here and this to me looks like the oh I wonder what this is actually I don't know what this is. It looks like the beginnings to me of a, oh gosh, a wild sesame. I think that's what it's going to be. You can see here it's going to have a beautiful kind of pinkish orange flower. There we go. And I think it'll eventually be about that tall, probably about two and a half feet off the ground. All righty, let us continue. <laughs> see what else we can find here in this blustery, blustery. <laughs> this, I don't, I don't mean to giggle at your question, but um, it's actually a really good one because I would, I think both Chandra and I would love to go and acquiesce to your request. You say, could you send one of the team over to the Drakensberg Mountains, which are about a hundred kilometers that way, Jandra's hat's come off again. About a hundred kilometers that way. Um, Liz, the answer is no. We couldn't really do it uh, physically because we wouldn't be able to get a signal from the camera into the backpack, out of the aerial, to one of our repeaters here on Juma, and then out to where you are. So it would just be too far away, I'm afraid. But it would be very, very special to go and do a walk in the Drakensberg. And maybe one day when the 3G signal is strong enough, we'd be able to do it that way. A bit like we did a little bit of Facebook Live this morning with Sean Gile. That might be possible one day. I still don't think that the cell phone signal is strong enough in that area at the moment, though Jandre is agreeing with me by shaking his dreadlocked head. Right, let's get his hat and continue. You clearly are not able to look after this, Jandre, so I'm going to look after it for you. Brian, you're interested in why those spiders are called baboon spiders and wondering, is it because they have a propensity to eat baboons? Brian, the answer is negative. They do not have a propensity to eat baboons. Um, <laughs> It's because they're hairy, like a baboon, and the color is very similar to that of a baboon. I'm, I'm wondering if you are asking that question tongue in cheek, Brian. I mean, a baboon would definitely eat a baboon spider, without question, baboons love spiders, they enjoy eating them. So a baboon may well dig a spider out of its burrow, but it's highly unlikely that the baboon spider would ever eat the baboon back. In fact, I think it's impossible. Now also around here, everyone, is a sort of nesting colony of dwarf mongoose. And I've seen them in termite mounds, all of these termite mounds here, all over quarantine clearings. But by this time of the day, I think they've probably all disappeared down into their burrows where they're warming themselves as this blustery night starts to fall around us. Let's continue just over to the edge of the clearings here and see what we can see here. <laughs> That's a very, very good question, DD Star, as I've spotted some more impala just over the thar. DD Star, you say, what happens if it rains? What happens to those baboon spiders? Does the water just flow down into the tunnel? How do they get it out? DD Star, I think you'll find that they are sufficiently narrow and hopefully not on sort of any stream where there might be a flow of water. So yes, some water would probably get in. I think it would be absorbed by the burrow underneath. And certainly that silken cover that we showed you would do, go some way to protecting the burrow from the water. Let's go and see if we can see a little bit more over the top here. I was hoping maybe there would be a wildebeest or a zebra or two, but I don't know where they've all gone. It's so nice to have these on-foot interactions with animals. We haven't seen a great number of animals today at all, actually, on walk. But that's not surprising, given the amount of wind that there is. Yeah, Jason Jones, um, as I'm trying to spot a... There it goes. Oh, there's no ways we're going to get that. Did you see it, Andre? Woodland kingfisher gone at 100 miles an hour. You got it there. Well done. Um, Jason, you want to know how fast the wind is blowing? 
Um, too fast to hold a steady shot. Too fast to hold a steady shot, says Jean-Dre. That's not surprising. I would say at its top gusting speed, it's probably hitting about 50 kilometers an hour, maybe, um, which is not very strong for uh, the kind of place that uh, Jean-Dre comes from, but it is quite strong for here. Right, let's head across to Jamie. She's got some signal and a striped antelope. Well, I have to confess, I've never been very good at the whole wind speed concept, the knots and describing it that way. I can tell you that it is very windy. You'll also be very happy to hear that we have finally managed to find some signal. Uh, we've been checking out the western fringes of Arethusa and unfortunately we disappeared for a long time. But the good news is we are back once again with a magical disappearing male in Yala who has now vanished behind the trees. Uh, a little bit earlier, they were actually, he was actually sparring with another young male. Unfortunately, with this wind speed, with it blowing in the way that it is, all of the animals are far more skittish than they might otherwise be. And so even just the action of us pulling up near them, they stopped playing and they started moving off almost immediately. And there was, I heard, off to my right, there was the sound of impala fighting as well. But I have a feeling that it's just one of those afternoons. It is definitely one of those afternoons. Would you please go into reverse, Rusty? Here we go. Uh, Hannes, you want to know if there is a folklore story. I'm trying to get this lovely Inyala bull on camera, but he's also being a little uncooperative. If there is any kind of a folklore story about why the Inyala has tan socks. He's being very, oh, now we're all running. Now there's mass panic and we're all running away. Impala dashing off. I think that's being caused by the rutting males, the, the males that think for some reason they're going to have a chance to mate, which definitely isn't going to be the case. And there they all have gathered. See how skittish and spooked they are. Sorry, you were asking about whether or not there are any local legends behind or reasons behind the, the Nyala's tan socks. Not that I'm aware of. I've never heard of one. Of course, this is something that many of our viewers have heard before and that um, I've often mentioned before. But my favorite uh, local story, and I'm not quite sure where local is. I'm not quite sure exactly where the story came from. But I do know that it was shared with me by a viewer called Teresa who shared the story of why the Nyala have, and the Bushbuck and the Kudu have the white stripes and spots on them. And that was the, the legend, so the legend goes. They're being very inconvenient here, Brian. They keep just moving out of reach. Let's try go forward a little bit, that might help. And then we can actually look at the animal. Oh, there we go. So there you go, see the white chevron across the face, and then the drips of white along the back and down the sides, and then the dots. So Teresa told me that there was a local legend that sort of went along the lines that the Anyala and the Kudu was so, their legs were so thin that it couldn't quite support their weight when they were first created. So the creator reached down and lifted them up. And wherever the creator's hands touched the body of the antelope, it left behind these white markings, like handprints. Which I think is an absolutely beautiful story. I'd love to know exactly where it came from, because I'm not 100% sure. But it is one of those stories that has stuck with me ever since. And just because, particularly with, um, with the dots on the Inyala. Oh! And back we go. See what I mean? There is much panic here at the moment. Everything is so afraid of what is trying to sink up on them, even if there isn't anything. Just the simple fact that the wind is howling and the bush is constantly rustling. They just can't, they can't possibly be expected to know what is a leopard and what is just a leaf blowing. So there you go, that I'm afraid is the only local story I know about Nyala colouring. I don't know if there are any, be any reasons behind the tan stockings. I'm sure we could make one up though. I'm sure we could make up a just so story equivalent of why the Nyala have stockings, or male Nyala have stockings. I'm sure, because the just so stories always seem to have, be linked by some sort of vanity in the animals. And I mean, when Hippo was hairy, he was a, it was because he was vain that he lost all of the hair on him. Um, and that the, I can't, which was the other, the warthog was also very vain. 
in some of the local legends. So perhaps there is a story as to why the Inyala ended up with stockings stuck on its legs. That might include some kind of sense of vanity. I'm sure we could think of one if we put our minds to it. But I don't know of any local legends that... that I always feel as though, especially with kudu, that white strip along the back looks as though somebody has run wet paint down their back and the drips, the stripes along the side are where it's dripped down over their sides. They are beautiful though. And those stockings really are very elegant. Perhaps there was a time that Nyala got stuck in mud or something like that. I can't think of a just so story. It's harder than it looks now that I think of it. I can't seem to make one up off the top of my head. Right, what were you two running from? Just a noise. I'm pretty sure it was just a noise. Okay. Right, let us carry on. Do a quick circuit around the Arethusa airstrip. Maybe Shadow's popped out there. It is one of her favorite places after all, or has been one of her favorite places. And we might see if we can find her. But while we do, and we head off and the wind is howling, it's definitely time for the bushwalk team to be indoors and safe. So let's head over to them so that they can say farewell. And for our final segment, everybody, the beautiful ring-necked dove, which is calling. Can you see it there? Beautiful. Sorry, it's a little bit wobbly. It is quite windy, of course. Right, let's just zoom out and say our final farewells. I just need to push a button quickly. No, no, wrong button. There we go. Now, you will notice that I have changed completely. Hello. There we are. That is what Jean Ray looks like. So when I talk about his dreadlocks, you know what I mean. Yeah, Very it. nice. There is his aerial. There we are. Uh, there's the entirety of Jean Ray, and of course his most spectacular feature being these absolutely astounding looking pieces of meat there. Isn't that amazing? Quite astounding. All right, everybody, that is going to be it from the bushwalk today. Bye-bye. Um, thank you for coming on the walk today. I had a marvelous time. We didn't find a great number of mammals, but we did see some very interesting things, including the dastardly act of probably some pugnacious ants killing termites. Until tomorrow morning, stay safe and happy wherever you are in the world and enjoy the rest of the sunset safari. Bye-bye. And now I've arrived at Buffelzok Dam while James has finished his walk and there appears to be nothing. Uh, the, no animals have come down to drink from what I've seen or what I can see and even the birds seem to have disappeared somewhat and I think it's because and you can see the ripples on the water it is very very windy the wind has definitely picked up quite a lot so I think what's happened is a lot of birds and animals are probably hiding in the thickets to try to stay out of the wind um, but what I'm going to do is continue so stick with us and let's see what else we can find while we drive around. Who knows, maybe we bump into some lions walking along the road. You never know. Or some people driving past. <laughs> And just move out the way here quickly. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? How's it going? Good, good. Enjoy. See you later. Bye bye. Some other people, some landowners, it appears, that are out on safari enjoying the afternoon. It's so great, and I always say it, but I do enjoy seeing other people out here and seeing how they're enjoying it and what, they, what they're seeing and chatting to them. They also had a plan of heading to Buffelsook Dam, but uh, I think they're going to be a little disappointed because there was nothing there.
So I hope the rest of you are enjoying your day wherever you are around the world. And if you are watching from your office, that's okay. We condone that, we don't mind it. And it might be therapeutic actually watching Safari while you're working away in an office, sitting on your computers. I know some of my guests do it. I won't mention any names in case they get into trouble. But I know some of my guests, uh, especially from the United States, end up sitting and every now and then they might have two computers, one watching Safari Live and one busy doing work, which is great. I think that's awesome. Uh, squeaky brakes, sorry, but have a look here. We have a kudu, it's just a female kudu and she's potentially trying to stay out of the wind and move into some thicker bush. I don't see any others, I know I do. There's one, two, three, four, four or five moving through. There's a young male with those small horns and some females now. What, what the kudu generally do is they do prefer moving through thicker bush because they are browsers, which means they feed off leaves of trees and they generally prefer this type of habitat. But I was saying earlier to Viem that with this wind, wind that we're having at the moment, and you can see these trees blowing in the wind behind me, it makes it very difficult for a lot of these animals to rely on their senses, their sense of hearing and their sense of smell especially. So what they try and do is a lot of them try and move in through thickets to try and get out of the wind a little bit more because when they are exposed and it's windy it makes it harder to hear potential predators coming and the kudu do enjoy these areas and they do prefer moving through thickets so that's possibly why we're not seeing too much at the moment is a lot of animals may be moving into the thickets try and look for shelter from the wind you could call it but um, the kudu do prefer it and if you have a look that feeds female watching us, she's got her ears pricked up and f um, focused on us because they've got incredible sense of hearing and those big ears are what they rely on a lot to pick up on any predators and uh, she's learning about other animals and how the wind affects them now while I'm speaking, clearly. <laughs> but anyway, let's leave them and continue and see what else we can find. Nice to see female kudu, that's a nice size herd. They're generally in small herds like that, not much larger uh, and usually the young Kudu will stay with them. That's why that young male was with them. The older males tend to move off on their own, own quite a lot, just like most animal species. Males stick with females for a period of time and usually when they're looking to mate and then they move off and they'll form bachelor herds and move around together. And pretty soon, because of this cloud cover, it's probably going to get a lot darker a lot sooner. So we will be able to use the spotlight a lot sooner and then hopefully try and find something interesting. Maybe an owl or a chameleon or a scorpion. That would be great. I haven't seen those little creatures for quite some time on drive. Going through a bit of a drainage line now. Um, so, we might find little owls. But uh, while I search this area carefully, let's head back to Jamie, who's still on Arethusa. We have completed the final area of our tests, which is right along the Arethusa airstrip. And let me tell you something, it's a little windy here. And we were driving the opposite direction a moment ago. And as you can see, my dashboard cover has been completely, I've just given up now. It can stay there for now. It's not raining at all. So I don't have to worry about protecting the electronics that are on the dashboard or just below the dashboard. But this wind is intense at the moment took my hat off at one point. But that's okay, we have finished off and since it is very quiet this afternoon, I feel as though 
Byron and I have swapped places. Yesterday afternoon we had the amazing leopard sighting and poor Byron was struggling for animals. This afternoon it's our turn. Whoop, whoops, we're going off the road. Sorry, every time I try and talk it feels as though the wind is blowing it blowing the air out of my mouth, <laughs> blowing the sound out of it. You holding on there, Brian? I don't know if he said yes or not. He might have fallen off at the back, I'm not sure. We just have to keep going. Okay, go away. <laughs> go away, stay. It's okay, everybody, Brian's still on the back. He's alive and well. We nearly blew away. Okay, that's a little bit calmer now we're off the open area and we've got a little bit of shelter. I always imagine in weather like this what it must be like being a bird. Uh, not, well definitely, the, I suppose the big ones and the little ones, to be, when you're trying to fly, being gusted about all over the place, because of course birds are such light little creatures. Even the big ones, um, compared to mammals, are relatively light. And it must be, it must be a very scary, perhaps it's fun though. I can't decide if it would be scary or if it would be fun to be sort of buffeted about by the wind. I always think about birds in weather like this. And this isn't even that serious. It never gets to, to gale force winds here in the Sabi sand. But for those of you that perhaps uh, come from very windy areas, and I'm not talking about um, extreme weather. I'm not talking about hurricanes or tornadoes or situations like that. Because of course, as we know, birds and other animals are very, very good at anticipating those sorts of events and generally getting out of the area or getting to a sheltered area as soon as possible. I just mean your normal everyday gusty weather. I find it quite extraordinary that they can, they manage to ride those air currents. Especially for those birds that migrate, or those, perhaps those birds out at sea that have to weather those storms and never land, like albatrosses. It is a truly phenomenal ability. Well, it seems as though the rain has held off. After all of that, after the mad rush to put our rain covers on, we, we got about five drops of rain and then it stopped. And now we're dry, which I'm quite glad we're dry because I forgot to take a jacket. But I was expecting something slightly more dramatic, the way it suddenly started bucketing down upon us. Oh, I do have one update for you all. Those of you who are wondering where on earth our beloved Nkuhumas have gone, they are on Simbombili, um, which is a property to the north and the east of, uh, west, sorry, of Juma. So, <laughs> on the other side, or the northern side of Arethusa, they're sitting there at Simbabidi Dam. So the, Arath the Nkuma Pride are alive and well, they are just not within our traverse area, so unfortunately we can't go and find them. But we can go and one make one last ditched attempt at finding Shadow. Just bear with me, sorry, something blew when we were in the air on the airstrip, something blew into my eye. And while we talk about our lions and our leopards, a very warm welcome to Lily. I say warm welcome, it's actually a bit nippy, but my, walk, my welcome is warm. Um, Lily, you want to know, do the territories of leopards and lions overlap or will they stay away from each other? Their territories do overlap because there's simply not enough space and there's too many leopards and lions and they're also not in, comp they're not in a reproductive competition with each other. So there's no way that you could have lion territory here and then leopard territory here and then another lion territory here. I shall stop. How's my signal, Rebecca? So as long as I don't move, um, which is wonderful because the, uh, the the landscape in front of us is positively teeming with animals. Um, so we don't have <laughs> we don't have leopard territory, then a lion territory, then it, it doesn't work like that. So what will happen is you'll get lion, and then lion, and then lion, 
territories, but you, within that you'll have leopards and leopards and leopards in their own territories. And there's no sort of, there's no correlation between their boundaries or anything like that. However, will they stay out of each other's way? Yes, absolutely. Um, particularly where, well actually that's not 100% true, because sometimes leopards get curious, particularly when there's a lion kill or when there's lions in the area, you'll very often find and sneaking around the edges is a leopard that's come to see what's going on. They're quite curious creatures. So they come in, they've got this look, they get this upright posture, because they know they're faster than lions, so they know that they can dash around, they know that they can dash away, um, as long as they've got enough distance between them. However, lions do kill leopards, and they will kill leopards if they can catch them. So yes, they will... Lions aren't bothered by leopards, but leopards will try and stay out of the way of lions for the most part. Uh, particularly... Um, lions, it's going to sound ridiculous, lions they can't see. What I mean by that is the biggest danger to leopards is lions creeping up on them because their territories do overlap. Um, there's no separate territories for them. And also bear in mind that a territory is a very, it's a very fluid thing. Lions territories, there might be one pride here and one pride here, um, and one pride might be all the way on this side of their territory, which means that this pride might slightly overlap into their territory for a while and then move off and come back, and this line, these lines will come back. And particularly with prides rather than with males. Males tend to be a great deal more aggressive. Um, but females generally, they roar, which is kind of their way of saying, hey, we're here, just stay away from us. And the other prides do the same, and everybody kind of knows where you stand in those situations, so they can stay away and not compete with each other. Can I move, Bex? Or is it a risk? <laughs> I can! I can move! However, on the on the condition that I send you across to Briaran. So without any further ado, off you go and I'll try and move. Now, we have not seen anything yet. I saw one impala dart off. Uh, but... coming to us. Oh dear, oh dear, it seems as though there has been an attack of the gremlins and unfortunately Byron lost his own signal and so we'll, luckily we seem to have ours, so we'll carry on towards Juma. And the good news is I think that we're safe from here on out. I think our signal should be absolutely fine from what I've experienced and what, from, from what I know of Rusty the vehicle that we're on, she's reliable in this area, so we should be okay. Now, Shadow, where have you gone? This morning she was on a baby Impala kill. I searched for that as well and it looks as though either she's moved it or it's finished. I couldn't find any remnants of it, but a baby Impala a leopard is going to finish in no time. An adult leopard is going to finish in no time. So what I'm going to try and do, I think, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to try and do. I'm not going to go in where Brent went in, because I've tried, I've tried that already this afternoon. She wasn't there. And I walked all around that area. So I'm trying to think if I want to take a risk, which direction I want to try and take a risk from and just pop my nose in, just to see if we get lucky. I don't know, eeny meeny miny mo. from the north or to the south. I think I'm going to try to the south. I think I'm going to see whether or not she's popped out on one of the termite mounds there. This area that she's in used to be, probably has always been, we just might not have found her as often recently, um, but it used to be one of Shadow's favorite spots when she had, when Cindile was still a cub. So Sindila is her adult male cub, adult, not an adult male cub, he was her cub, he's now an adult male. He's fully grown and he's independent, with quite a long and quite a complicated backstory. But when he was a cub a year and a half ago, we used to find them very regularly in this area. And I'll never forget, I was so upset, I wasn't upset, I was just slightly jealous of the time that I found a drag mark in here. 
and I walked for a little bit but I didn't have any luck and then I had to come back to the vehicle so because we can't we can't obviously disappear off the vehicles for too long and Brent Brian was Brent on tracking team he must have been he must have been Brent was on tracking team and he'd taken Brian with him and they went for a walk and Shadow happened to be probably about 10 meters away from where I stopped looking but she she gave you a rev didn't she Brian her and Sandita both of them <laughs> what I mean by that is that Brent and Brian got charged by both leopards not just Shadow apparently I always thought it was just Shadow but apparently it was both of them that came and growled at them and they did did they do the stiff legged thing or was it just no, just growling growl and move off that feels like a very very long time ago okay shadow the other big problem is let's go in here this is this is in line with where she was just on the other side of the river system Okay, see if I can't find us an easyish way in, but this could get a little bit complicated. Okay, sorry, let me just think about this for one second. I'm just going to try and figure out, I should have done this with a bit more light, but because of the clouds it's actually got very dark very quickly this is also an area where we've very frequently found shadow mating with Tingana wait that's not true we have in the past no, I wouldn't say very frequently but we have in the past on more than one occasion found shadow mating with Tingana so I should in theory remember the easy ways in here but unfortunately my memory hasn't been as obliging watch heads you okay there Brian right I marked the GPS position on my phone so that I'd be able to approach from the other side and pop out roughly exactly where she was Here's a nice little track here. I think I've accidentally stumbled upon the road. The good, well, not a road, an area where people have made their way in. No, no, don't be silly. Yep, this is exactly right. Okay. Sorry, everybody. We're going to squeeze through here. It's not too bad. And just keep your eyes peeled because she could be anywhere here. I'm hoping. Stranger things have happened on these live drives. I've just driven over some wild aniseed. The smell, the air is suddenly filled with the smell of licorice. Oof, in this weather, she could be anywhere. Uh, Jackie J, you have indeed heard correctly um, that Hosan, Hosa means chief and that when Hosanna, Karula's son, gets larger, he will, his name will change to Hosa, which means chief, rather than his current name, which means little chief. And you are absolutely correct. He is, it, that will hopefully happen because obviously you can't call a big male leopard, a big scary male leopard, little chief, can you? It doesn't, doesn't quite work. So that was the, always the idea, was that he'd have the, an, an affectionate diminutive uh, when he was little and then as he grows older and more awe-inspiring hopefully we will be able to call him not Hosanna but Hossa, the big chief. Bear in mind of course that that might not work in practice because he could disperse outside as we've seen with Kunuma and the lodges that will regularly see him might not go by that particular title. 
Right, while well, I'm scouring this area with my spotlight and hoping that Shadow might just pop out of the shadows quite literally, it seems as though Byron is all set for the fall of evening as well. I've got a spotlight and I'm casting a shadow, Jamie. That's about it for shadow for me. Um, but no uh, no sign of any animals just yet. I don't know. I think we're going to struggle in the wind this evening. But let's see. Let's scan. <laughs> Where are all these chameleons hiding? Wouldn't it be great to see a honey badger coming out, running around now? That would honestly make my day, make my year. I've not seen a honey badger for ages. So that's what I'm looking for. While Jamie is looking for a leopard, I'm going to look for a honey badger. Sure, very, very windy. And Rebecca is giving me an update on what I've just said. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> Shame, I think sometimes the, <laughs> the ladies... <laughs> Where did that go? Lost my microphone there, sorry. See what happens with this very windy, these very windy conditions. But luckily, I have wired it to my person connected to our battery pack. See what happens when it's quiet. We speak about everything else bar the animals because we can't find them. So as I was saying, the ladies in the FC um, have got a few different radios that they need to speak into. Occasionally they pick up the one that was meant for the other person and they give us updates, but we are very thankful for having them around and give us all the questions. So very important, very important role. The voices in my head, as I like to call them. <laughs> so I'm not completely crazy. There are voices in my head. Sure. This is... Uh not looking good. I haven't even seen an impala or two running around. And I'm sure those females are all very nervous in this weather because this is good hunting weather for predators. They can, they will be able to sneak up and approach their prey a lot easier because it is so windy, it's noisy, um, and it would prob probably also um, cause their scent to disappear a lot quicker because of the wind. So ideal hunting conditions for predators. I wouldn't be surprised if we find a few carcasses around tomorrow with predators on them, maybe leopards, lions, who knows? I thought I saw some lightning in the distance, but I think I'm seeing things. Last night we had a lot of lightning around. It was wonderful to see in the distance. Some birds calling some starlings. Uh, uh, wolf guy and wolf girl would like to know what sea animal would I like to see? Um, uh, sea animal. Hmm. 
love to see a whale shark. I, I, think, I think a whale shark, a orca, and a great white. And those three I would love, love to see. Alright, there's some impala ahead. I'm just going to turn the spotlight off a little bit because we know their eyes are sensitive at night. See, they are all in the clearing. And there's some, I can see little lambs darting off. So yeah, I think a, a, um, a, a whale shark, they look amazing, very interesting animals. Um, a orca, I think they're beautiful, I think they're incredible predators. And then a great white. Now we've got some of the best great white viewing in South Africa, or in the world. Uh, I think Australia, Australia also have good great white viewing. But, um, but in the Cape, down in Cape Town, the great white viewing is really, really incredible down there. And a lot of people, a lot of tourists go there specifically for that. So maybe I should uh, try and make a, a holiday of it and go and try and see some sharks down there. And I must admit, and this is a secret, um, I'm not a fan of scuba diving. And I, I'll get a bit claustrophobic, I think. And also being under the ocean, I'm not comfortable with that. It's, I'll happily walk through this entire area, unarmed, by myself, completely comfortable. I don't mind that. But don't put me under the ocean. That's uh, it's funny, but I'm just not comfortable with that. Uh, but I'm happy to swim in the sea and jump off a boat and what, but going underneath, not a fan. What little bird is that? Is it a little Franklin? Oh, is it? Oh, it's a little, sorry, a little crested Franklin. Um, it just looked a little different in its behavior, but I think maybe the light disturbed it. There we go, he's moved off to the side. So I'm going to continue searching these areas for little creatures, nocturnal creatures, and let's head back to Jamie for an update. I'm also thinking about searching for little, little creatures, and one creature in particular, which is the lesser galago, or the bush baby. And somewhere on this road, since I haven't seen had any success with Shadow, I'm hoping that our bush babies will be in one of their favorite nest sites. It's impossible to predict, of course, because bush babies will often go and sleep in different places day to day. So it's not as though they return to exactly the same spot every single night. But we have found a few of their bush baby holes, and I'm hoping perhaps tonight, since I haven't had much luck otherwise, um, I'm hoping that tonight they might be home. Byron told me something amazing, which I am astounded by, because in the entire year and a half I have never ever heard them. But Byron tells me he saw a greater bush baby um, at a lodge called Voyatella. And sorry, let me go. There we go. Hello? Anybody home? I'll, I'll get into why that's so amazing in a moment and what those animals are in a second. Let's just see if anybody's home. Hello? <laughs> it happened once and every time now I go and I check this bush baby hole. No, it didn't happen once, it happened twice. Where the bush baby all of a sudden stuck its head out and it was the most adorable thing and well-timed thing in the world. But I think it was a little bit hopeful of me. From what I can see from the holes in the... Oh, hold on, he's coming. Dude, what the heck? <laughs> I'm so sorry, little squirrel. <laughs> Brian, that wins. That does, win. that does win. The sequel to the bush baby face poking out in the form of a little squirrel. <laughs> oh, I love this job. <laughs> they never fails to keep one thoroughly entertained and thoroughly on your toes. <laughs> All right, little squirrel, I'm sorry. Let me take my spotlight off you. 
I'm not too worried because they are okay with lights and I'm not shining directly on it and it will be able it will go straight back into its hole so it's not that it's going to be wandering about um, in the evening time but I'm gonna take my spotlight off it now but that was utterly hilarious <laughs> bye <laughs> good night <laughs> good night yes <laughs> Oh well, he's still watching us, it's too funny. It's very hard for you to see because it's so dark and I don't, I don't want to keep the spotlight on him because he is a diurnal animal. But that is utterly hilarious, he's still sitting there with his head poking out of the hole. What you doing? Let's just take one last look, I know it's very difficult, the light is very very dark. What you guys doing? That was too funny. That was so unexpected. Didn't this happen to Brent recently? Was it Brent? It was somebody that I'm sure I remember Rebecca telling me um, Brent's checking for bush babies. He's found a bush baby. No, it's a squirrel. I'm sure that's just happened recently. Well, it's just happened to me now. <laughs> Rebecca says mine is better and it wasn't the same hole. <laughs> that was so cute. <laughs> oh, I really do love moments like that. They certainly keep us guessing, don't they, Brian? <laughs> cute man. Alright, little squirrel. Bye. <laughs> and Daniel? It's gone to bed. Daniel, he wants to know if it's normal for squirrels to be in bush baby holes. Yes, it is. It's very normal for the two of them to use each other's nesting sites. Generally, a bush baby group, because they do sleep in groups, they sleep in, in not necessarily family groups, they can be unrelated to each other, but they will sleep in groups together. Uh, they won't necessarily go into a a roof, for example, that's been inhab inhabited by squirrels, that's perhaps full of squirrel droppings and and bits of food and bits of cuttings from whatever the squirrels made their nests out of. Um, but it is common to see, particularly with holes in trees, they get utilized by all sorts of things. That could just as easily have been a, a bird. It could just as easily have been a, a crested barbet or a, one of the, the, the nesting birds that live in the hollows in trees. So it's, and it's particularly common with, with squirrels and bush babies. Squirrels, of course, are not in any way related to bush babies. Bush babies are primates, they're miniature primates. And I was telling you before I got the surprise of, of today, I was telling you about what Byron saw, which was the thick-tailed or the greater galago. That's a bush baby this size. Not quite. Let's not exaggerate, Jamie. This big. This is a really very big bush baby, and I did not, for one second, think that there were any on Juma. If you'd asked me, I would have said no. Probably not. Because I've never heard them, and they, they, they are the ones that really truly scream like babies. That's where the name bush baby comes from. I have never heard one, and yet there's been one living at Voyatella Lodge the entire time. Who knew? And now, James, you wanted to know, speaking of greater bush babies, how the diet of the greater galago differs from the lesser galago. Um, it's, one of the big things is less, greater galagos, the big ones, are not as dependent upon tree sap as the lesser galagos, and they'll actually go for slightly larger insects and things that they can find. So being that much bigger, obviously, they need to eat bigger food, and they can't sustain themselves in the same way that little lesser galagos can on tree sap and on moths and so on that they catch. So the one big difference is that you you hardly ever see baby bu uh, little bush babies or lesser galagos on the ground. That you do, but it's really only when they're hopping from tree to tree and they just have to cross a road or something. Whereas thick-tailed bush babies spend quite a lot of time on the on the ground. It's only res really that they go to roosting trees. Other than that, they spend a lot of time foraging on the ground. And that's because they're after a different, they're not after sap, they're not really after moths, but they're after beetles and things that are slightly more substantial 
than what the lesser Galago might be after. I still can't believe that squirrel. It really did make me chuckle. Oh, truth Anne. You want to know if bush babies can be kept as pets? Yes, they can. They shouldn't be. Uh, we, I have very strong feelings about keeping wild animals as pets. It, it always upsets me a little bit to see a wild animal kept as a pet in that sort of environment. It, I struggle with it. We, you know, we have cats and dogs and horses and we've got a variety of domestic animals that have become dependent on us through centuries and generations of breeding um, and I feel that a lot of the time wild animals that are kept as pets in a lot of contexts are done so almost as a status symbol in fact it's exactly what they are they're a status symbol I'm very cool look at my unusual pet I've got a serval for example however Bush babies fall out of thatching all of the time when they're little, um, at which point their death would be almost inevitable. And yes, I know a few people who have had bush babies as pets. They are utterly adorable. They are also little alcoholics. So you'll have guests all sitting at a bar or with their drinks in front of them at the dinner table and particularly with whiskies, um, these little bush babies love them and they'll fly out of nowhere, jump onto the table and try and get to the whiskey and if they are not allowed to do so they get very angry and also bear in mind of course that the way in which bush babies function um, both males and females in terms of marking their pathways through the trees is they'll stop and they'll sit down and they'll reach down and, and urinate a drop or two on their feet and then they, on their hands and they rub it together and then they rub the soles of their feet with it and then off they go for the night so every time your bush baby jumps on you it's um, with pea covered hands and feet if you are able to cope with that, and if they are rescued for the right reasons, they're adorable. They are, I have to confess, there's nothing, because a lot of them, once they've been raised by people, they live wild, and they go off and they do their own thing, and then they come back and visit. And there's nothing like this little thing perched looking at you with those massive eyes on your shoulder. But yes, it's not something we encourage, and not something we agree with in general. The pros the um, possibility of keeping wild animals as pets. Uh, I have no doubt that Byron knows a few people people with pet bush babies or bush babies that they've raised. Let's head over to him so we can find out if he does. So, uh, Jamie, I don't actually know anyone who has um, or who keeps bush babies as pets. My um, so here's a funny story. My uncle is a farmer down in the Eastern Cape, so down the southeastern part of South Africa. A very very large farm down there, and he farms with um, cattle and sheep and angora goats. Now, in that area, there's a lot of wildlife. And he's got three kids and these kids living and growing up on the farm and I used to spend a lot of time there too. You always bump into little creatures and abandoned little creatures and then they would keep them as pets. And when he was younger, he told me he had a bush baby. But, um, but so he did have bush babies running around the house apparently, one or two. But the thing is the bush babies are quite dirty and they urinate on their hands and that's how they mark their territory. So they do, um, do begin to smell and it's not ideal having bush babies around. They are incredibly cute, but uh, but I think the smell gets a bit much. But he's had all kinds of creatures. I think they had a um, they had uh, Surrey cats or, or meerkats, also known as meerkats. He did have some of those at one stage. Um, ground squirrels. He had some of those, and all of those little animals we don't actually get out here because the landscape and terrain and climate is very different. They prefer the semi-arid to desert areas. So they had some of those. Um, what else did they have? They, at one stage they had a warthog that they found that they kept around. Don't know what happened to the warthog. But um, all these weird and wonderful creatures that he would find driving around the farm and then bring it back home and give it to the kids and say, here we go, we're going to look after it or not. 
So, and it's um, usually not ideal, but uh, but if it's abandoned, we pick it up along the side of the road, and you can imagine. And the thing is, a lot of farmers and that within within Africa or Southern Africa, especially in the old days, they never really knew any better. They didn't know about conservation. They didn't know um, that you could potentially harm the animal more by trying to take them and look after them. And that usually it ends in in heartache because people grow attached to it and they're still wild animals they end up leaving or they end up being killed by something else so it's it's very tough but uh, but the farmers never really knew any better so they would think they were doing a good deed but generally generally you shouldn't try and save wildlife or look after them if you find them in the wild or pick up anything try keep it as a pet rather um, because you can potentially do a bit more harm than good. I mean, obviously, abandoned animals that are endangered and people try to have research projects and try and look after um, animals that have been potentially wounded and injured because of people, that's a different story. That, I think it's our duty to look after them and try to save them. <coughs> Excuse me. So it appears as if the wind has chased everything away. Now, Debbie, I wonder, are you, I'm, I'm not too sure, you wanted to know if bats are able to hunt in this wind? Phew, Debbie, um, I think it would be quite difficult for them. Um, I'm sure they would though, bats are, incredibly agile and I do think they do have to fly around and, and hunt even in this wind and and they do indeed Debbie because I just saw two bats fly overhead so yes they do <laughs> that just answers the question however the thing is in this wind you probably don't get as many insects flying around and that's generally what a lot of the um, the bats will feed on so um, it might make it a bit harder for them to hunt because there's just not a lot of food around. But they do fly around and as I was saying, they're very agile and they are able to fly in weather like this. And two of them just flew over us. So yes, bats can definitely hunt and fly in this wind. That was easy. That was a great question, Debbie. Thank you. It's always nice when things pop out when you when you're speaking about it. But anyway, some Impala, I'm going to turn my spotlight off. And on that note, excuse me, on that note, I'm going to say farewell. Thank you, everyone. Hope you've enjoyed this afternoon with us and evening from myself and from VM on camera with me. Hope you've enjoyed it. And let's head back to Jamie. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye. I thought I saw a chameleon, but it was a false alarm. And it doesn't count towards the chameleon jar that I've decided should be established. We mentioned it. A, we went, no, no, no. We did mention this a few days ago on drive, and I said that we should be penalized for any false chameleons that we spot that are not actually chameleons. But I think that we should just specify that it should be off when we're when we're talking, when we're live. It can't not when we're off air. Otherwise, we are going to be broke. We are going to be. <laughs> Very short of funds. So broke. And welcome to Debbie. Oh, actually, almost goodbye to Debbie, but we're not there just yet. Debbie, you wanted to know if bush babies have a number of preferred nest holes or if they will only have one. They have a number of preferred nest holes, and they'll actually they'll actually move from place to place but they always seem to gather together so despite the fact that they move from one nest site to another depending on the day um, they'll always seem to snuggle up together at night and there's usually one but there's often there's occasionally even two males of fully fully grown sexually mature males that join up with the group so they're not they're funny little creatures they they don't have the sort of the normal set structure and territorial and social structure of most other creatures out here. Um, what was I saying? Oh yes, so they do have a number of nest holes, they don't always nest in holes. Sometimes they actually just find a nice 
thick branch with lots of leaves that they can all cuddle up on and they'll hide there, high up in the tops of trees. So it's not always holes. In the, in the way in which they move from place to place, they're a little bit like dwarf mongoose. You can go and find a dwarf mongoose colony, you can see them go to bed in one hole one night and then the next day they'll all have moved to the next hole just because that's where their foraging has taken them and they don't, they don't want to travel too far afield. So it really is thoroughly dependent on the situation. Yes, unfortunately we didn't manage to get a bush baby on camera, but we did manage a surprise squirrel, which is utterly entertaining. And no shadow either, so we'll just have to try again for the sunrise safari to see if we can't find her. She's been very mysterious, our shadow. She's been hard to find. And actually, she, she had, dis up until relatively recently, she had disappeared for almost a month. Now I'm hoping she might be spending a little bit more time on Juma and the surrounding areas. Alright, Rebecca's voice in my ear tells me that we only have a 60 seconds left of drive, which is terribly sad. It's gone very, very quickly. Um, but it is time to do our goodbyes and our thank yous. So a big thank you to Brian for your wonderful camera work. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. And of course, thank you to the thumb for riding along with us. Uh, Brian, a drumstick thumb. A crispy drumstick. A crispy drumstick thumb. <laughs> I love it. A uh, big thank you to Rebecca and to Jerry and Final Control, to all of the Safari Live crew, tech team and all of the behind the scenes staff. And most of, most importantly, a big thank you to all of you for joining us, sending through your questions, uh, comments and all in all making our drive that much more entertaining. We'll see you tomorrow on the Sunrise Safari. Bye bye everybody.